Okay. Good morning. For the record, my name is Linda Rosenthal. Uh, welcome to the December 5th, 2022 meeting of the Economic Forum. We'll begin with agenda item number one, which is a roll call. Mr. Crom. Present. Mr. Levitt. Here. Mr. Zahn. Present. Vice Chair Lewis. Here. Chair Rosenthal. Here. Thank you. The next agenda item is uh, opening remarks. I have a few brief comments. Um, I would like to again welcome the members, presenters, staff, and any members of the public to this meeting of the Economic Forum. I would like to thank the Legislative Council Bureau's staff for their assistance in setting this meeting uh, up and their work today to allow the meeting's agenda to be completed. At today's meeting, we will have forecasts presented by the various forecasters on the state's major general fund revenue sources, and we will be approving forecasts for fiscal 2023, 2024, and 2025 for each revenue source. Additionally, we will, be, we will review the Technical Advisory Committee's forecast approved at their meeting on November 29th and approve a forecast for the minor revenue sources and tax credit programs. Finally, we will approve the Economic Forum's report that will be reported or provided to the governor and the members of the leg legislature as the forecast approved today is required to be used by the governor in developing the executive budget submitted to the legislature for the 2023 regular session. Like the November meeting, we will have a presentation by Emily Mandel from Moody's Analytics on their economic outlook and forecast for the sales and gaming taxes, but her presentation will be made virtually this time. After that, we will proceed through the agenda items regarding forecasts for the major and minor fund revenue sources. Once the forecasts for all the revenue sources and tax credits have been approved, we will recess to allow staff time to input our decisions in the forecast tables and the forecast report. Given the length of the meeting, it is my intent to have a short break for lunch, but the time for that break will depend on how we proceed through the agenda items and the need to recess to allow the staff time to complete the forecast tables and report. With that, I would like to ask any of the other members if they have any opening remarks they would like to make. Seeing none, then I would like to proceed with any public comment under agenda item number three. I would also ask Mr. Gindin as staff to the forum to assist me as needed in conducting today's agenda. For public comment under agenda item three, is there anybody here in Carson City that would like to provide public comment? Yes, ma'am, go ahead, please introduce yourself. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal and members of the committee. Good morning. Apologies, I have a little upper respiratory, but not COVID. My name is Leah Case, Bells and Case Government Affairs, and I uh, overheard you talking before the committee started, and I am actually here because it is the one-year anniversary of the passing of Carol Villardo, and I thought it was so fitting that we were having an economic forum on this date, and I just felt called to come up and, and say a few words about her. I recently learned that there are some lobbyists in my cohort who did not have the opportunity to meet her. And I am just saddened by that because there was at one point in my 2015 session as an intern lobbyist where I sat at a table discussing the commerce tax with Carol Villardo and Jeanette Bells. And it was probably one of the most intimidating and awe-inspiring moments of my life. So I just um, wanted to thank you for having this meeting today. And uh, in memory of Carol, I would like to share two things I learned from her. Number one, the uh, closer the nexus is between the tax and the user, the better it is. And number two, there is no perfect tax. So um, thank you for your time today. And in memory of Carol Villardo, uh, I'm excited to be at Economic Forum. Thank you very much. Anybody else who'd like to make public comment here in Carson City? Okay. Um, how about in Las Vegas? Anybody down in Las Vegas who would like to make public comment? Okay, seeing nobody. Then I would ask BPS staff if there's anyone who's called in that would like to provide public comment and assist us in, in receiving their comment. Thank you, Chair. The public line is open and working. However, there are no callers to offer public comment at this time. Great, thank you. That brings us to agenda item number four, which is the presentation on the national, regional, and state economic outlook from Emily Mandel, um, economist with Moody's Analytics. 
Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, my name is Emily Mandel and I'm an economist at Moody's Analytics. I'll just share my screen here and we can get going. Okay. So you've heard this before, but I say this disclaimer every time I present. Um, I work for Moody's Analytics, which is an independent entity from Moody's Investor Service. So nothing I say today should be construed as having any bearing on any ratings actions, past, present, future. Okay. With that out of the way, let's move on to the economic outlook. Um, similar to last time, I'm going to speak a little about our national economic outlook, how that has evolved or more frankly is similar to um, what I presented to all of you a month ago. And then I'll talk a little bit more about Nevada, our outlook for the state. And then I'll show our new um, updated forecast tables for the sales and use tax, tax and the gaming percentage fee tax. So this chart looks a lot like the one I showed you a month ago. And that consistency is going to be a theme for my presentation today. Um, here, we're seeing the forecast for real GDP growth. Um, this has been updated to reflect our November forecast vintage um, versus last time when I made these forecasts, um, we were working off of our October vintage. So a little bit of an update there, but it is very similar, um, maybe a little bit flatter in that years, but not substantially. And that's because our outlook has not materially changed between these two months. Our assumptions have remained the same. So our baseline forecast, this blue line is still recession free. That said, the outlook is tenuous and there's quite a bit of risk and we're gonna discuss that um, um, and the different types of risk we're facing right now. Um, even under this baseline though, and you can see this here in the 22-23 um, forecast is that we're expecting a significant slowdown. We've been referring to this as a growth recession um, meaning that while the economy doesn't contract year over year and it wouldn't fit the criteria in order to be classified as a, you know, formal recession under that criteria that the National Bureau of Economic Research uses. Um, when we're going from such a strong growth that we've had coming out of the pandemic recession over the last couple of years to this very weak pace of growth that we're anticipating, it and when that's happening so quickly um, over the span of essentially a year, um, that's going to feel a little bit like a recession and we're going to see slowdown in a lot of different areas of the economy. Um, it's possible we'll see layoffs. Um, it's possible that we'll see the unemployment rate tick up a little bit and that's all baked in, into this forecast. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, when we're essentially flat for a year, that means that some parts of the economy are still growing, but another major portion, the other half of the economy can be actually contracting. And so that slowdown is going to be significant, even if it's not running, going to be a full recession in our baseline forecast. Um, to put the size of the slowdown we're anticipating into context, we can look at prior history here, and you can see prior recessions on this chart um, denoted by these gray recession bars here. Um, our baseline outlook is going to, would be more similar to a 2000 or 2001 type of recession. Even back then, without some of the financial market impacts that we had, I don't know if that would even have been termed a recession. Um, because it really just went down to around zero. So that's what we'd expect in our baseline, but not being formally classified as a recession, more as a, quote, growth recession, which we've been calling it. I'm not going to focus so much on these alternatives here today. I know we covered them in depth previously, um, but we can circle back to these other possibilities at the end um, if you'd like. So last, like I talked about last time, inflation is going to be key to the outlook over the next year. Um, recent data, and we really need that inflation to start coming in. And we're starting to see that start coming in. We're seeing at least the last month's CPI report in line with what we need in order to remain on this path that I've laid out here. Um, 
and that inflation really needs to come in so that we don't end up with even higher interest rates than we're going into and an even more deliberate slowdown of the economy. So part of this reduction in um, the CPI, part of this reduction in inflation is already kind of on autopilot here, um, but not all of it is. And there's going to be a few different phases to how we think this um, slowdown, the slowing of inflation is going to play out. Um, first off is ties back to commodity prices. This is part of the reason that inflation is so high and so persistent um, that as it is today is because we saw this really rapid increase in oil prices um, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine and other commodity prices as well. But if we just have oil stay at its current level, at its current price over the next year, this would have a major impact in bringing down inflation just through the base effects there. Um, currently, inflation in the past month was at 7.7%. If we just get stability in some of these commodity prices, that would bring it closer into the maybe 4% range. So that's without any um, significant decline, but also without any um, new shock that would raise those prices higher. So that's phase one here. Energy, of course, is that yellow bar on this chart. And you can see that's already starting to come in a little in terms of the year ago change there. The second part here that um, is going to be important in getting this back um, back down. And another part that I'd say is already, if not on autopilot, then very much, you know, heading down the freeway, it's very much moving ahead. And that is the cost of housing. Um, I'm sure all of us are aware we've had these massive run up in housing, um, both in Nevada and nationally over the past two years, but that has started to turn. Um, we're already seeing prices roll over in especially in single family housing, and also starting to see that, that come through in some of our multifamily. We're seeing some demand destruction as people just can't afford <laughs> prices at current levels, especially with mortgage rates up the way they are. And so this is intentional by the Federal Reserve. They're trying to bring in some of this activity um, and it, it's succeeding. We have to see how severe an impact this is going to have on the economy, this um, you know, rapid reduction in housing activity here but it's going to have positive impacts in terms of bringing down prices. And we're already starting to see that there's some lags just in terms of how this is um, measured um, by um, the BLS, but it is on track. It's already starting to happen. The third step here and the part that I'd argue is going to be most difficult and less, least kind of guaranteed is that in order to get this CPI growth from you know, maybe 4% uh, down further to where we really need on our, um, to the Fed's target, which is around two, two and a half percent, is we need wage growth to moderate. Um, services is a major part of this other category here, the part that's been increasing there. And so that service price inflation is tied back to these labor shortages we've been feeling in the economy and the pressure that's been putting on wages. And so we need the labor market to cool down. We need these higher interest rates to really work in bringing down the pace of job growth in order to cool some of that wage pressure, in order to bring us that last step of the way down to target. Okay. So speaking of the labor market, this is kind of a, like a mixed mixed bag right now. It has positives in that this is a major reservoir of strength in the economy here. This is the reason that we're still in expansion, that we aren't falling into a recession at this point, is because we have this really robust strength in the labor market. Um, this chart here, you're just seeing the difference in jobs nationally from month to month over the past year. Um, I've updated this to add November, so it's slightly different from what's in your deck, but um, no surprises there. The We've continued to add jobs quite quickly here. And that would normally be kind of an unambiguous positive, but we're in this topsy-turvy world where too much of a good thing is actually a bad thing, at least when we're looking out maybe a year or so, when we're looking at getting those wage pressures under control. Um, and last Friday's job report, this November value here was a little bit in that vein. We added some 263,000 jobs. We saw a provisions to the prior month. And that was just um, 
that's going to be a little bit concerning for the Federal Reserve as they work to bring down some of these pressures. So some areas of the economy, we're seeing some of this move through, but this past month's um, jobs report was a little bit concerning in that regard. It's positive in the sense we don't have recession, it's negative in the sense that it's going to keep some of that pressure on wages. The other reservoir of strength here, first one is labor market. People have jobs, that's um, you know a really important support for consumer spending. Um, second reservoir of strength here is how much cash consumers have. This is similar to a chart I showed last time. It's a different visualization of some of the same data um, that we discussed previously about consumer balance sheets. Um, you can see here that the different amounts of cash that are held by different income groups um, and at different points in time. So going from the top to the bottom here, those are our different income quintiles. Um, household income, the top one, 150,000 to 500,000 versus our lowest of under $28,000 in income. And then we can see this at different points in time. The blue bars here are prior to the recession in 2019 Q4. And then we can see kind of in the middle of that when we're getting some of these stimulus payments to start come through. And then you can see what that's like today in 2022 Q2, so last quarter, two quarters ago. Um, and what we can really see here is that these balances are up significantly for all except for the lowest income tier here. Um, and that's a positive in the sense that it means that people have a lot of resilience. They're able to kind of spend through these higher prices that we're seeing. Um, but there's also implications here of this is what the Federal Reserve is really trying to lean hard against is this demand that's out there in the economy just because people have these resources. On the low end here, um, we talked about this briefly previously, um, that under $28,000 income bracket, um, that's the main area that's shrinking. Um, but you can see the way these are stacked up that the as a share of actual spending in the economy is an actual kind of dollar value of how much resources are there, it's fairly low. Um, the implications on this from a government perspective would be more on the expenditures tied in terms of utilization of social services rather than a revenue side, um, just because there's less spending that's taking place in this in this group. So these are the positives, um, but I'm gonna talk a bit about the negatives because there's definitely a lot of warning signs in the economy right now. Um, and those are coming from some areas, but not all areas of the economy. So this chart is a lot to throw at you. I know there are a lot of numbers on here and numbers are generally you know, the enemy when we do these types of presentations. Um, so don't worry about reading this through piece by piece. Um, but what this is showing is a number of indicators that we track in order to kind of get an advanced warning of recession risks. Um, these are ordered by timing, which is really important here, that middle bar of time to recession. Um, and so the order kind of ranked in terms of their relationship to the business cycle. The top ones here tend to um, start deteriorating further in advance of previous recessions. Um, the bottom ones are lagging indicators. And so for those, you might not see problems until you're in the recession itself. Um, this data has been, I updated all of this data last Wednesday. So if there's <laughs> issues here, it's probably um, new data that we've gotten in since there, but it should be pretty up to the minute here. So many of the, so you're seeing kind of a, a trend here, right? The indicators that are higher up on this chart are reds, they're oranges versus what we're seeing lower down is more green here. And so the higher risk ones here and the ones that you're seeing in red tend to be financial in nature. And so these are tied to investor behavior and they're more sensitive to some of these um, interest rate increases that we've been seeing. Um, and, oh, I'm sorry. And more sensitive to some of the risk that we're seeing in financial markets. Um, that's And so some of this yield curve inversion, we also talked a bit previously about how there's the stress that we're seeing in housing. That's definitely a warning sign here. But on the other side of this is consumer sentiment. It's been very stable in recent months. And as we look at those two previous areas of strength in the economy, a lot of it ties back to the consumer. And that's an area that's held up fairly well. 
Um, we're also seeing the strength in the labor market. And so there's some reason that financial conditions might not be as indicative of recession risks as they have in the past. So this is definitely something that's important to keep as we kind of, you know, balance the potential risks of the economy and coming up with these, um, as you come up with these revenue forecasts here. But the main reason that maybe they're not as um, flashing red, maybe not as um, problematic as they would be in the past is that consumer and business balance sheets generally look good. Um, there wasn't as much debt issuance in advance of the past couple of years as we've normally seen before a recession. And so because we don't have as much over leverage as perhaps we had in 2008, as we had in um, previous recessions, um, it's possible that these tightening lending standards might not impact the economy as hard as we've seen in the past. Okay. So let's shift over to Nevada here. Um, and we can see that these same trends that we've been discussing at the national level, um, they very much hold true for Nevada as well. First off, um, and I'll move through this a bit more quickly here, um, is that the labor market is showing a lot of strength. The red line here is unemployed workers. So people that are currently looking for a job and haven't got one, that peaked above 400,000 workers at the height of this pandemic, but it's come in very quickly since then. Um, blue here, job openings. Um, those are businesses that are actively trying to hire. Those are people that still say, you know, we need a person. We're trying to bring them on board. They're not like, you know, maybe in the public sector where it's a budgeting maneuver that you're trying to keep this role open. They're, you know, businesses that are out there trying to add to their payrolls. And you can see just comparing that red line and that blue line that there's still about one and a half job openings for every person that's looking. Some of that comes down to just mismatches between who's looking and what jobs are out there. Um, we've definitely seen more pressure in some industries than others, but it's a point to um, the strength of the labor market. Green here is layoffs. You can see those are extremely low by any standard. And that really points to the fact that businesses have been having so much trouble hiring that they're holding on to what workers they have. And this is one of the areas that we think is going to help us coast over some of this stress in the economy is because these labor pressures aren't just for today. They're also something that businesses are eyeing for the next couple of years and honestly longer term as we have some of these demographic pressures really reduce the available labor in Nevada and nationally. Yellow here, just to finish this out, is quits. These are people who are quitting their jobs, whether they're looking for something else um, or just retiring. And this is a little bit elevated. This is something that we'd like to see come down just as some of this um, strength in the labor market hopefully gets a little bit more normalized and start to come in a little bit. But all of these indicators here are showing a very strong labor force here. So part of the implications of a strong labor force is it's leading to some stronger growth in incomes. And this is really important as we look towards some of these um, tax revenue categories in a moment here. Um, the two blue lines here are um, transfer payments to federal governments. These are the stimulus payments. That's why we've got this jumping around here and the really big increases there. Um, you can see that that's normalized, that's come back, but it's still fairly strong and it's still expected to stay fairly strong through the forecast here. We have this, I have this juxtaposed against consumer prices. And the important thing to see here is that inversion, that green line moving above the blue line, which means that prices are rising faster than wages. Um, this hasn't really happened before. Um, the inflation, last period of high inflation back in the um, 70s was largely due to the um, sorry, um, back in the 70s, um, wages were keeping up with inflation, which was honestly kind of a problem back then because it led to this more entrenched cycle. And so this slower income growth than price growth is a negative for consumers because it's, you know, means they're spending more than they're bringing in in terms of how these are growing. But it's also what we need in order for this final step of that inflation um, path to be realized. Of course, there are 
broad and real implications for rising costs, even as income growth remains fairly strong. One of those has been on housing, um, and Nevada has been impacted more than most states in this regard. Um, what you're seeing here on this chart is domestic net migration. So these are people that are moving within the country from one state to another. Um, either those are people moving into Nevada, which is reflected in green here, the inflows, or there's people that moving out of Nevada, and that's orange here. The difference is the blue bars. And what I draw your attention to here is that this has been falling pretty significantly over the past, past year. And I would attribute this to um, rising costs, just the rising cost of housing in the state. It's having an impact in terms of just the population growth of the state. Um, this is fairly high frequency data. It's not going to align perfectly with the net migration data that we'll get out of the census in a year, but it shows that there's starting to be a real impact from those high housing costs in terms of people moving into the state. Still positive, um, and that's something that, you know, a lot of other states would love to have here, but it's something that um, I think is important to keep in mind. Now, this should be temporary. Um, like I mentioned earlier, housing is already in recession. Prices are already starting to come down. I was looking just at single family prices in Nevada. I think they're already down something like 4% since June. So we're starting to see some of that progress, which will make this a bit more affordable for people. Um, Nevada is going to maintain its appeal from its you know, tax system. People um, benefit from, um, from its you know, just amenities from the state. So I do think this is gonna turn around here, but this is just another reason that we're gonna get a bit more um, of a, a little bit more cyclicality over the coming year. Okay, finally here, um, the net result of all of this, of these higher interest rates, these slowing prices, but still elevated um, from this, you know, essentially from the Federal Reserve putting the brakes on the economy, is that we're entering a new phase of slower growth here. Up until now, like we talked about, Nevada's economy has been performing very well. We can see that Nevada, despite suffering a really significant blow from the pandemic, um, it's moved ahead of where the West and the US counterparts are currently. Um, that you can see with that blue line passing, the green line passing the orange line here. Um, but over the next couple of years, that net job creation is pretty much flat. Um, that aligns with what we're talking about from the national perspective in terms of this, um, you know, weaker job creation, some increases in layoffs in some sectors of the economy. Um, the net result is payrolls essentially flat over the next couple of years, small increase in unemployment. Further out towards the end of this forecast, you could see an uptick, and that's where we're seeing in those interest rates to start come back down. That's as we move through this current period, um, once we get inflation under control and we start to see stronger growth as a result. So the main question here, and um, you know, the thing I think we're all thinking about is how we're going to navigate the next couple of years, how much of a toll this is going to take on the state's economy in the process. This is what I have for the state or in the US outlooks here. I'm happy to take questions about this or I could move on to the revenue outlooks here. No questions. Okay, thanks. So for the revenue outlooks, um, this is the our new um, forecast for sales tax collections. Um, we expect continued strength through the first quarter of the next calendar year, um, so the next couple of quarters of the forecast here. Um, and then we expect that um, growth will start to cool to more typical rates. Um, the main drivers here are spending on goods and wage and salary incomes. Um, we've got some positives here. Um, there are, you know, inflation is a positive just in terms of raising the nominal prices of goods. Um, and then also we have this strength in the labor market. So people have jobs they're able to spend from those incomes. Um, negatives though, of course, we have some cooling demand, cooling, we have higher cost of credit. People, as they take out maybe loans in order to spend as they pay their credit card balances, that's getting more expensive. We also have some spent up demand as well. There are pe people spent a lot on durable goods um, and other goods during the 
pandemic and the year following because of these significant balances. So as some of that, you know, comes back and as we get some normalization from there, um, that is going to be a bit of a negative here. So we have some pluses and minuses. Net result is um, moderately moderate growth through this forecast. This is just the table to reflect that. As compared to our November report we provided to you, these are all slightly lower in level terms. Um, that's partially due to a slightly than weaker expected fiscal 2023 Q1 and some of small tweaks in the forecast here. But given all of the risks that are facing the economy right now, I think this downgrade um, seems warranted. I'll just shift over to the gaming percentage fee over here. Um, this is, of course, more sensitive to the business cycle, and we have a slower, a weaker outlook here than we have for the sales tax, sales and use tax outlook. Um, the main driver here is national recreational services spending. And our forecast for this has not changed appreciably from our October forecast to our November forecast. And so this forecast that you're seeing here and what we provided to you previously is very similar to um, from October. Um, we have some you know, pent up demand from vacations is fading. So we expect some declines there. Um, we're also, like I talked about previously, the strong dollar is a negative for international travel. Um, that said, consumers still have a significant amount of resources. And so that is preventing a more severe um, disruption here. And also, as I imagine we'll hear about a bit later, there's some high profile events coming to the state, which could also provide some extra, um, extra power to collections here. But altogether, this is the forecast behind these numbers. And this is, like I said, very similar to what we sent previously. Um, last month, there haven't been significant changes to our outlook here. And with that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Linda Rosenthal. Uh, just one question. When you presented to us in November, you were able to give us kind of on a, on a high-level basis what uh, percentage you uh, ascribed to inflation in the different years. So I think it was 8% in 2022, 4% in 23, and then kind of the mid-low 2% in 24. Have those changed with this revised forecast? No, those are, I have it in front of me, and those are pretty much exactly what we're still expecting in our November forecast. The main change that I don't that we've done is we are increasing our forecast for um, interest rates slightly. I think by a quarter percentage point in the um, in the Federal Reserve's terminal rate. I think previously we had some that at four point seven five. We're expecting that to go up a bit higher to five percent, and that's I think just a reflection of some of the communication that we've been seeing from um, the Federal Reserve about their. Um, you know, very strong motivation to start bringing this in. That hasn't had a significant impact on our forecast here. It's more on the margin, but that that is the main change. And I think that's part of the reason that our CPI um, numbers are similar to what they were previously, because we've upped that a little bit. Can change daily, right? <laughs> Surprise reports. And yeah, I know, right? <laughs> right? Any other questions? Thank you very much. Appreciate your update. Thank you. Um, before we move forward in the agenda, I would just like to ask um, both the forum members and, and staff and anybody else um, presenting if they had a chance to review the, the report that will go to the governor and the legislature, if there are any proposed changes to that report at this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate uh, you as uh, the members of the forum and the chair. Uh, sort of going to that agenda item and going a little bit out of order because it assists us as staff that if you had changes that you wanted to make, then we could be working on those to expedite. So with that, uh, I do need to put on the record, though, Madam Chair, uh, uh, Steph, looking at it this morning, noticed that on page 25 of the report, uh, in the last paragraph, uh, you see economic forms May 1st, 2019. That should actually read May 4th, 2021. So we apologize. But we want to, well, so staff will make that correction for the date. And we just wanted to disclose that uh, on the record here because this, then the report would look different 
for the final one that this body will end up approving and going to the governor and the legislature. And so with that, we will make that change. And then uh, otherwise, there'll be no changes. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, if it's okay with you, I'll just go on to the next agenda item. Thank you. For the record, Russell Gindin with the Fiscal Analysis Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. And so then, uh, as you're uh, all aware of, uh, the next agenda item is item five, presentation of historical taxable sales and gaming market statistics. And this is, again, just as close that uh, all the charts have uh, been updated and placed in Nellis on the Nevada Legislature's website for the economic forum section. So what we have is an additional month, September, for the taxable sales, and we have an additional month of October's win and November's collections for the gaming uh, metrics. Uh, and so we have uh, updated all those and placed them up there. I don't intend to go through them. Uh, depending on if there's any questions or discussions, uh, they can be brought up to assist in uh, answering or addressing a question or a statement. And with that, Madam Chair, that was only the comments I wanted to make for that agenda item. So uh, if there are no questions about that, okay, then uh, with the, Madam Chair, if it's okay just to go to the next agenda item, which is agenda item six, which is the review and approval of the major forecast. And so uh, like la at the last meeting, we will have the other people come to the table and we'll just progress through them. And uh, then I think, Madam Chair, is what we've historically done is we'll just go through the revenue source and for the game, start with gaming percentage fees and go to the live entertainment tax. Uh, that way we can go through and have Mr. Lawton from the Gaming Control Board take care of his two revenue sources. And then he is, uh, gets to leave the table while the rest of us stay here and proceed through the rest of them, if that uh, works for the chair. Great. Uh, one comment before we, we begin with this agenda item where we're hearing the forecast. I would like to ask each forecaster to uh, focus their remarks on changes, differences that were made between their November forecast and the forecast presented here in December. Um, and, you know, just the reasons for the change. You don't have to go back through all of your, your forecast methodology. Just, um, just give us the, the quick uh, variables that might have changed during this last month. And with that, we'll go ahead and, and turn to the gaming percentage fee tax. Yeah, and Madam Chair, I apologize. Well, uh, the, uh, Mr. Lawton and uh, Mr. Gotari are coming to the table. Uh, that I'm not going to go through all of them. You have the tables that are in the packet. But I do need to make the comment uh, with regards to uh, table one that it begins on page 37 of the packet. And rather than me taking the time to try and put it up on the screen, uh, I would just have you, if you turn to uh, page 38, you'll see there's no uh, data in there for the modified business tax. And then uh, going to the top of page 39 for the total MBT and then for the insurance premium tax. And th that's only because uh, normally what we would have for this December meeting is the Department of Taxation would be uh, able to report the first quarter for the insurance premium tax and the modified business tax. Uh, but the, due to technical issues with regards to the tax returns coming in and being able to get them processed, uh, they weren't able to report uh, the first quarter for FY23 for the MBT and insurance premium tax. Thus, to make the table as apples as apples as possible, we had to remove the FY22 first quarter. Otherwise, the table would show that we were significantly down year to date, which would not be statistically correct. So I just wanted to put that on the record that uh, people looking at that, that uh, there are collections for the first quarter in FY22. It's just uh, taxation with technical issues was not able to get them. So then the forecasters did not have that first quarter uh, for FY23 to be able to take into consideration uh, in doing their forecast. Uh, and so, Madam Chair, I appreciate that. You're uh, used to all the other tables. I do just want to point out that you do have, again, table eight, which on green paper, which is sort of the table I think we tend to look at and use for as we're trying to go through the decision making and documenting what's going on. So I just wanted to uh, point that out. And is the rest of it's uh, ditto from the November meeting in terms of all the different tables. And then there, the, what's outside the packet is the charts that we had like last time. And unless there's any questions in any of the tables, uh, I don't plan on addressing each one. They are there in case they're needed to, again, to address a specific question or an issue. 
And again, with that, then we can uh, proceed with uh, Mr. Lott starting us off. And if you'll give me just a second to get his uh, slides up. Thank you. Thank you. So I have his up. His is displaying on the side screens here. Um, okay, I'm ready, ready for right. you. Uh, good, mor good morning, Chairwoman Rosenthal and members of the Economic Forum. Uh, again, Mike Lawton, Senior Economic Analyst with the Nevada Gaming Control Board. It's a pleasure to be here today presenting to you. Uh, as you can see in the tables provided to you, the Gaming Control Board's forecast for percentage fees were revised up slightly from our, the November meeting. This minor res revision was the result of stronger than anticipated slot revenue uh, performance on the Las Vegas Strip in addition to several other markets in the state. Uh, once this data was incorporated into our models, the forecast produced slight increases to total gaming win and taxable gaming, gaming win throughout the forecast period. In turn, this also increased the associated forecasted totals for the estimated fee adjustment and percentage fees on taxable gaming rev revenue. Uh, just a real quick update on October uh, 22 and its its strength uh, and its weaknesses uh, wasn't wasn't very weak to be honest with you. But total win was 1.28 billion dollars that increased 4.8 percent or 59 million dollars over last October. Um, I think I might have alluded to in the November meet in the November meeting there could have been an all time record. It wasn't. Um, our table games win came in a little softer than we had hoped, but we'll get to that in, in, later in my forecast. Um, Compared to the pre-pandemic month of October 2019, uh, gaming win again was off the charts, up 25.3% or 258.9 million uh, over 2019's totals. And again, it represented the 20th consecutive month that statewide gaming win uh, was in excess of a billion dollars. Um, the driver th for this month's increase, surprisingly uh, to me, uh, were the state's combined markets outside of the Las Vegas Strip. Uh, they increased 10.6% or $55.3 million, so almost the entire increase came from those markets. Um, that represented the largest increase for those markets recorded since February of this year. Uh, the combined markets have now recorded three consecutive monthly increases. Um, and that is following up four consecutive year-over-year -year decreases in the period April through July. Uh, the Las Vegas Strip, it continued to set uh, record amounts of gaming win. Uh, they, they won $705.8 million. However, it was just a slight increase from uh, last October. It was up 0.5% or $3.7 million. Um, although the Strip's total win was basically flat, uh, slot win was actually record-breaking. Uh, the Strip recorded its highest monthly total in slot win all time ever, uh, and that was $410.4 million, and that was due to uh, a coin-in total of $5.1 billion, which was also an all-time record. So pretty historic month for the Strip in terms of slot win. Uh, obviously, the Strip continued to benefit from another incredibly strong uh, sports and entertainment calendar. Uh, I believe we had several concerts, residencies, and of course, um, multiple high-profile sporting events. Uh, in terms of percentage fees, uh, percentage fees came in at 76.4 million. They were up 6.4% or $4.6 million. So we get to my first actual slide that this is gonna show us our, the board's total win forecast for the um, period. Uh, in FY22, we are forecasting $14.8 billion, which is an increase of 1.7% or $242.6 million compared to FY22. Uh, this is a $61.6 .6 million or 0.4% increase over our November meeting. Uh, in 24, we are forecasting $14.3 billion in uh, total gaming win. That's a decrease of 3.5% or um, $512.8 million. Uh, in 25, we are forecasting total gaming win to decrease 1.5% or $208.9 million with $14.1 billion in total gross gaming revenue. Uh, for the fiscal year where we're at right now, currently we are at 4% or $243.4 million. The comparison over the last seven months of the fiscal year is an increase of 33.5%. Uh, the strip comparison is an increase of 57.3%. 
Uh, the average growth required to meet this forecasted total win amount is an actual decrease of 0.01%. So uh, we're not asking for anything crazy here. I would just like you to know that in three of the next seven months, we'll be facing a comparison of the second, third, and fourth highest gaming win totals all time. So the comparisons are not only differ difficult, they're historically difficult. So um, three tough comparisons in four months we could, we could possibly beat. Um, you know, it's gonna, be, it's gonna be tough to come in flat, in my opinion, even with all the good stuff that's going on out there. Uh, our forecast remain built on the assumption that statewide gross gaming revenue will peak during FY23, and the catalyst for this growth will be the Las Vegas Strip, which is hosting various distinctive special events and conventions during the next 16 months. We've discussed those in, in last November. The event calendar is amazing. Um, of course, our models have taken these events into consideration in addition to an expected moderation in current levels of gaming win due to an anticipated pullback in consumer spending as a consequence of record high inflation, rising interest rates, and volatility in the stock market. With the Federal Reserve attempting to lower inflation by ongoing interest rate hikes, the gaming industry continues to look for a slowdown in consumer spending. Although these trends have not surfaced yet on the Las Vegas Strip, the board feels that it would seem reasonable to assume some impact over time on leisure spending. As these two conflicting variables converge, in our opinion, a realistic outcome estimates that gross gaming revenue could decrease somewhere between 5 10 to 10% in FY24 and 25. Uh, under this scenario, gross gaming win would still be in a range of between 13 to 19% higher than it was during the pre-pandemic FY19. Uh, moving to my next slide, we take a look at our slot win forecast. With October's results, our FY23 slot win forecast totaled $9.9 billion. That's an increase of 1.2% or $117.9 million compared to FY22, and an increase of $69.3 million or 0.7% since the November meeting. Uh, the cause of this revision was due to October 22's uh, slot win totals coming in stronger than anticipated. Slot win totaled $877.3 million and increased 11% or $86.7 million on a coin in total of $12.2 billion, which was up $470.7 million or 4%. Very strong numbers. Uh, as I had mentioned, the strip set an all-time uh, win amount in uh, slots off of a, an all-time uh, high in coin in. Uh, the strip slot win was up $42.2 million or 11.5%. Uh, the markets outside of the Strip recorded a $44.4 million or 10.5% increase um, as well. So the, the slot win statewide, not just the Strip, was extremely impressive. In FY24, we were forecasting $9.6 billion in slot win. That's a decrease of 3.8% or $374.1 million. In FY25, we were forecasting slot win to come in at $9.5 billion, which is a decrease of 1.3% or $126 million. For the fiscal year, slots are at up 3.3% or $135 million. The comparison over the last seven months of the fiscal year is an increase of 28.5%, and the strip comparison is an increase of 53.1%. Currently, uh, fiscal year to date, slot volume is, is very healthy, up 3.1% off of record levels. Uh, the average growth to meet this forecasted slot win amount is a decrease of 0.3%. As discussed last month, the business activity the state is experiencing in slots remains stable. However, as comparisons have become more and more difficult, several markets' growth rates have not only moderated, but have began, begun to show decreases. As a result, we anticipate that slot revenue totals will begin to level off and decline in 24 and 25 as consumers continue to face mounting headwinds. Uh, the next chart is the board's game and table win forecast. With October's results, the FY23 games win forecast totaled $4.8 billion. That's up 2.7% or $124.7 million compared to FY22. And that's a decrease of $7.6 million or 0.1% compared to our November meeting. Uh, the cause of this revision was due to October 22's game and table win totals coming in softer than anticipated, primarily due to the Las Vegas Strip, which had their games win decrease 11.5% 
or $38.6 million, and drop was down 14.7%, or $368.3 million. Uh, the primary, one of the reasons for this, this the strips uh, decrease this month was Baccarat, and Baccarat, October uh, for the strip, was a decrease of 30%, or $27.9 million, and volumes were down 17.8%, or $109.4 million. So once again, Baccarat, you know, showed what damage it can do. So in FY24, uh, we are forecasting game and table win to be at 4.7 billion. That's a decrease of 2.9% or 138.8 million. Uh, in FY25, we are forecasting game and table win to total 4.6 billion. And that's a decrease of 1.8% or $83 million. Uh, for the fiscal year, uh, games are up a solid 5.5% or $108.4 million. The comparison over the last seven months of the fiscal year is an increase of 45.5%, and the strips comp is an increase of 62.9%. Uh, currently, uh, games volume, it's healthy, it's up 1.2%, um, and the average growth to meet our forecasted game and table win amount is an increase of 0.6%. Uh, as I discussed in November, the game and table win figure in FY22 was 6% above the previous peak, uh, which was an FY14, which was $4.4 billion. Although our game and table win amounts aren't quite as robust as our uh, slot win totals, game win amounts are still very impressive when you consider the fact that the, a key component of table game win, which is Baccarat, is not at record levels. Uh, and of course, that's due to that game's reliance on international players from the Far East. However, at this time, fiscal year to date, Baccarat is currently up 11.5% or $54.1 million, and volumes are up 3.4% or $108.5 million. Uh, Baccarat this fiscal year so far has benefited from an increased hold percentage. Fiscal year to date, it's sitting at 15.8% versus 14.6% at this time last year. On the non-Baccarat side of table game win, it's healthy as well, up 3.6% or $54.3 million. And non-Baccarat drop is up 0.5% or $58.4 million. Uh, again, benefiting from an increased hold percentage fiscal year to date of 14.2 versus 13.8%. Similar to slot win, uh, the activity the state is experiencing in uh, game and table win remains solid, however, as I had mentioned, comparisons for the Las Vegas Strip are becoming more and more difficult, and due to a potential softness in consumer spending, along with the always somewhat uncertain outlook for international Baccarat play, we expect game and table revenue totals will begin to level off and decline in 24 and 25 as well. Uh, lastly, get, getting to what everyone is here for today, percentage fees. Our uh, 23, fiscal year 23 percentage fee forecast, we're projecting a decrease of 2.8% or $27.4 million with $936.8 million in total collections. That is up 8.3% from our initial projection of $928.5 million in collections in November. The primary cause for this revision is an increase to the estimated fee adjustment. Fiscal year to date, uh, percentage fee collections total $410.9 million and they're basically flat down just $122,000 at this point. Uh, as for the two components of percentage fees, uh, percentage fees on taxable gaming revenue, they currently total $398.3 million. They are up 3% or $11.7 million. And then the estimated fee adjustment collections are currently sitting at $3.6 million and are down $11.8 million or 76.4%. Uh, the average growth needed to meet this forecast to achieve um, the uh, 936.8 million is a decrease of 4.8%. Meanwhile, the growth over the last seven months of FY22 compared to the last seven months of FY21 is an increase of 23.5%. As discussed in November, the EFA con collections um, totaled $33.7 million last year. So that makes for a difficult comparison for us this fiscal year. And as you know, the EFA is the difference between the amount of tax due on taxable gross gaming revenue for the current month, less the amount of tax paid on taxable gross gaming revenue from three months prior. So due to the record levels of gaming revenue growth the state recorded in FY22, EFA collections have been a positive contributor to the state's record level of percentage fee collections. However, as gaming revenue totals begin to moderate and slightly decrease as we have forecasted, EFA totals are expected to decrease as well. 
So in our forecast, the decrease that we are presenting to you today in percentage fees is entirely due to the forecasted decrease in EFA collections, 33.7 million last year. We've upped that to 5.4 million this year, and that's a decrease of $28.3 million, which is pretty much the entire decrease that we're forecasting. Uh, in FY24, we are forecasting a 5.4% decrease um, in percentage fees, which is $50.9 million and an $885.9 million total for percentage fee collections in 24. And then in 25, um, we are forecasting percentage fees to basically be flat, coming in at $885.9 million in total collections. That concludes my discussion and presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have any at this time. Thank you, Mr. Lawton. You're welcome. Next, we'll we'll hear from Jason Kotari, Kotari, <laughs> from the Executive Budget Office. Thank you, Chair Rosenfall. For the record, Jason Kotari, Executive Branch Economist, Governor's Finance Office. Starting on slide three, my gaming percentage fee forecast relies heavily on expected gaming volume and gaming win. I separated out slots, bock rot, and everything else for statewide gaming volume. When discussing the broader economy, consumer confidence remains relatively low and interest rates remain relatively high. However, jobs continue to be added and the unemployment rate remains relatively low. As of November of 2022, uh, the U.S. unemployment rate is still at 3.7 percent and near a 53-year low. As a result, I have statewide gaming volume dipping slightly in fiscal year 23 and 24 and then increasing in 25. My forecast also assumes that international business and convention travel will continue to improve and will approach pre-pandemic levels over the forecast period. On slide four in my forecast, the gaming win is a mathematical function of historical relationships between win and volume. The expectation for the forecast period is that this historical relationship will hold. Next slide five contains my gaming percentage fee forecasts. With better than expected percentage fee collections in October, budgets total estimated collections in fiscal year 23 increase, increase slightly due to the adjustments from the year-to-date actual numbers and pretty much remain the same from the November meeting in the following two fiscal years. Collections are estimated to total $938.8 million in fiscal year 23, $907.8 million in fiscal year 24, and $935.8 million in for fiscal year 25, moderately decreasing in the first two fiscal years, as they did uh, at the previous November meeting, and then increasing slightly in the last. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Gindin. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Russell Gindin with the Fiscal Analysis Division. And uh, you have the Fiscal Division's packet available to you, and I just wanted to bring up the one slide, I think, to provide the comments for the Fiscal Division's forecast. And so that would be Table 1C. That's on page 30 of the packet if you want to look at the printed, but I have it up here on the screen. And so what this does is, is it shows you the difference between the December forecast that's uh, highlighted in yellow and the November forecast that's in the green highlight, and then in the orange below is the difference. And as you may recall at the uh, last meeting that um, I had concerns about the effective tax rate. And so uh, I had to make adjustments there. But before I get into the details of it, that standing behind sort of the fiscal division's forecast for the revenues today, is we, I'm not going to go through them, but at the front of the packet is the, uh, our outlook for uh, the key economic variables. And if you look at those, you really don't see any difference between the forecast because we really didn't change. We did get an additional month of the employment numbers, but no more quarters of the wages uh, or personal income. But we really didn't have any information to uh, force us to change things significantly with regards to employment, wages, personal income. Uh, and in fact, if you look at Moody's forecasts and those charts for Nevada for those same components, they did not also 
They also did not change their outlook much. So that's really, uh, in a sense, the, the economic outlook that we're driving through our revenue forecast is pretty much the same for fiscal, uh, for this December forecast versus November. So it's mainly the reaction is looking at if you get another month of the, the tax or um, we got this additional month of visitors for October, which is uh, better than what I thought it was going to be when I was looking at forecasting that. Uh, and so that's the construct that lays behind it. So then, then again, coming back to the percentage fees, uh, you can see that uh, Mr. Lawton's already uh, covered all the numbers well in terms of we have the additional month and what it means. So that's when I got that number, I ended up in FY23 revising up the slot win a little bit for FY23, uh, but then not much for 24 and 25, as you're looking here at the orange. Then uh, because of the gaming and then just realizing I, I think I had I was way too optimistic on the hold percentages and where they would be, uh, and so pulled those back on the game side as well as pulled back on the drop a little bit. Uh, so that brings the, the, the games win forecast down over all three years that you can see here. And, and so then there's, uh, in that first year, the slot win increase nets out a little uh, against the games win. But then uh, where you see is the taxable gaming revenue changing, and, and this is, I'll get into the effective tax rate, but because of Mr. Lawton uh, giving consideration to the statement I made at the last meeting, he went and compiled some numbers and did some analysis and provided that to me to, to look at what went on in FY22 uh, in terms of the 6.59% tax rate, but as, when we were driving 14 uh, you know, million excuse me, 14 billion through the uh, TGR. And so uh, that, that made me realize, okay, I wasn't thinking about how the, 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 um, the TGR percentage fees component works with regards to an adjustment we had to do just with the pandemic and what it caused for how those numbers were reported. Well, then looking at that, realizing seeing the October number of my ratio of TGR to win for it was too high for the FY23. So you can see I've lowered that by almost a half a percentage point. Uh, so that's why you see the TGR coming down and then uh, realizing that it'll sort of go down a little bit in FY24 and then come back up a little bit in FY25. So it's sort of the same pattern as last forecast. I just had to pull the path down uh, because I was just too optimistic. And then the October number, what, what, what I would have to Average over the last seven months of the fiscal year, I just thought was unrealistic. So that's the FY23 change for the ratio. And then you can see I had to bring the average effective tax rate down because the 6.62, 6.63, and the 6.64 that I had in November, they were just uh, unrealistic given the, the analysis and the data that Mr. Lawton was able to provide me and work through. Uh, so I appreciate him being able to do that. Um, and thus, you know, I still have sort of the similar pattern that there, I do believe the average rate does have to come up as you increase taxable gaming revenue. I was just too high. So because of that, then you can see we basically are lowering the forecast down by uh, approximately 11 million in the first year, FY23. And as Mr. Lawton stated, you can, you can see now our forecast is basically it's down by one-tenth of a percent. Why? Well, you can see I have... Uh, the percentage fees from TGR being offset by the change in the FA, just as Mr. Lawton's forecast. Uh, and so we have a little slightly different growth in the FA, but uh, we end up standing close to the same place in terms of what the net effect is. Then going forward into FY24, the, the net effect of having changing the TGR, the win ratio and the average effective tax rate, as well as the changes to the, the total win, it lowers the forecast down to by approximately 7.2 million, and then continuing out in FY 2025, it lowers it by approximately 7.5 million. Looking at Table A, and with that, Madam Chair, those were the statements that I wanted to make with regards to the fiscal divisions uh, percentage forecast and the reason for the changes compared to the one presented to this body in November. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, for the record, this is Linda Rosenthal. I actually have a question. So on uh, page 30 of the um, Fiscal Analysis Divisions packet, it helps to be able to see the components, right? So you've got the percentage fee TGR, the percentage fee EFA, and then 
the total? Because if we just look at table eight and you see the percentage changes, that really doesn't tell you the story in terms of a mindset on you know what you're assuming for growth, especially in this environment where we've had you know record gaming win for 20 months now. So um, it, it's very clear, I think, here what the uh, fiscal analysis division's numbers are. I wondered if we could get some, kind of a sense from from the agency and the budget office. Um, where your, I guess, percentage fee TGR percentages are, and then if you are in in line with fiscal, then on the EFA, it sounds like the agency and fiscal are, just to get us an underlying growth rate of what you're assuming year by year. Hopefully, that's not too confusing. So we'll start with Mr. Lawton. Uh, for the record, uh, again, Mike Lawton, senior economic analyst with the Nevada Gaming Control Board. Uh, Member Rosenthal, I believe you want to know what my TGR to win rate forecast is. I'll start with that. Uh, what the percentage fee TGR growth is year to year to oh. compare to, so in the fiscal on okay. page 30, the, the yellow items percentage fee change year ago, the yellow items in the bottom part of their table. Okay. Yep. So TGR on percentage fees growth rates is what, we're, is what you're asking for first. Yeah. So similar to like for fiscal 23, okay. they've got the 2.9, the 4.1. Okay. Yep. Um, for FY23, we have $936.8 million. Oh, excuse me, that's not right. Okay, $931.4 million in percentage fees collected on TGR for FY23. That's an increase of 0.1% over FY22. FY24. 903.8 million in percentage fees collected on TGR. That's a decrease of 3%, 2.95. Then finally, FY25, 890.6 million. It's a decrease of 1.5%. Do you want the EFA forecasts as well? Uh, yes, or just an indication if it's similar to fiscals. Okay. Um, Whatever it's easiest. EFA in FY23 is $5.4 million. It's a decrease of close to 90% compared to the $33.7 million in FY22. My EFA is a negative $17.9 million in FY24, and that's as a result of our gaming revenue forecast decreasing, right? FY25... The EFA is still negative, but much improved compared to FY24 as gaming revenue mounts are beginning to flatten out. Um, we are projecting a negative $4.7 million in EFA collections in FY25. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. So there's quite a bit of disparity uh, between your forecast and uh, fiscals, both in the, the growth rates and the resulting TGR, as well as the percentage fee. I'm just looking at the, the forecast period, and there's some pretty wide variances. And so in order to come yeah. up with a logical forecast that makes sense in terms of what we think is going to happen from a growth perspective, just have to kind of peel the onion yeah. a little bit to get to some of those numbers. So, uh, um, if, so there might be some follow-up questions, but if we could maybe just turn to the budget office, if you could walk through the same thing for your forecast. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Jason Gortari, Executive Branch Economist uh, with the Governor's Finance Office. Um, I have my total gross revenue to win ratios in fiscal year 23 is 95.9%, and then picking up to 96% uh, in fiscal year 24 and 25. And then um, for the estimated fee adjustments, I have them declining by $8.3 million in fiscal year 23, declining again by 7.2 million in fiscal year 24, and then declining by 11.6 million in fiscal year 25. Thank you. And Madam Chair, Russell again for the record, just that this is the difficult revenue source because of the statutory structure for the tax. And so um, 
Yeah, since we're, the fiscal division has the growth occurring in 24 and 25, uh, again, for us, it's because of the two big special events uh, that will be in 24. Um, but then with the TGR growing, then the EFA should probably be net positive uh, versus if, like, for GF, uh, GFO and GCB, having if TGR declines, then the EFA should go down. You can get strange times when new properties open and all that, but generally the TGR growth and the, then the delta in terms of the change of the, or the net EFA, they should move in the same direction. And I'm sure you're all aware of that, but I just thought I'd point out that, and, but that is the difficult thing and possibly for the form to reconcile that fiscal's got growth, so the EFA is net positive, yeah. but it backs off to down. You can see uh, it's less, it's a smaller, positive and 25 because there's less growth uh, versus when you've had it declining, then there should be a negative EFA, and that's a hard thing to reconcile by looking at them. So my, uh, I was going back to comments made by Mr. Lawton at the November meeting that in their mind, GGR peaks in 23 and starts to come off. I mean, it's been an incredible run and, and it, they would still be very elevated levels, just, you know, hard to continue to, to grow off historical records. Um, so looking at the numbers we just walked through then, you know, 0.1% growth in TGR in 23, then declines, right, in the subsequent two years, which is very different than the other forecasters. Um, that's what I was trying to get at, that, that underlying growth so that we could rationalize what we think the direction of that growth, you know, is going to be. I know, Mr. Uh, Gindin, you just mentioned, you know, 24 being strong on some of the special events, but it's, it's growth over 23, which has very significant special events as well. So just make that comment. No, and that's a very good observation, Madam Chair, and uh, acknowledge it being the one that has the growth occurring. And so two events may, in two months doesn't 12 months make uh, as a fiscal year. But I guess as I was looking at it is that, well, probably some of these record months that we're seeing some of it could be to, to what I call still the pent-up demand of people coming to Vegas. But I think also some of it is that what's going on in Vegas and see that probably being able to continue into FY24, but then FY25 possibly walking back a little bit because as, at least at this point in time, we haven't been told that there'll be an F1 and clearly won't be a Super Bowl. But it doesn't mean there, there can't be other events because just – Possibly uh, all of us had a chance uh, to watch the the Pac-12 championship at Allegiant. Also, the, the Notre Dame played Utah uh, in the Shamrock Classic. So I think you're going to see those types of things being coming to Vegas. Uh, and I think that's maybe what drove some of the record numbers that we're seeing in 23. And I don't expect that they won't be able to bring those kinds of events because – those facilities are there, and they'll want to put things in them. Um, and so, yeah, it would – could I be a little optimistic that because, to the chair's point, you're, you're pushing against, hey, you had that event this year and you had that event last year, so how do you get that much growth? That's a fair observation. Uh, but um, I just think, you know, there's got to – Inflation will back off, but there's still got to be a little bit of inflation in some of the growth in 24 and 25, not the, the 7 or 8 that we're seeing now, but that 2 or 3% range. So they still think there could be some nominal growth in the win, and thus the collection, is the, that's sort of where I got to. But clearly, could, could I be a little overly optimistic in terms of what's happening? Yeah, possibly. I think that's a fair critique, Madam Chair. Thank you. Uh, for the record, Linda Rosenthal, just one more question. Do we have year-to-date, whether that's September, October, um, growth over the prior year in the percentage VTGR? Uh, Madam Chair, if you look at page 29, so if you just flip one back, I think to answer your question on Table 1B on page 29, uh, Mr. Lott went through them, but you'll see there for each of the components, there's, the, there's fiscal year-to-date to the first five months showing you what the dollar amounts were, and then below that are the growth rates. And then down below would be what the last seven months are and then what the fiscal's forecast would have to be. Thank you. Uh, to hit the forecast. Perfect. Thank you. Any questions from any other form members? Just 
I don't know that I have a question. I just make a, the, the way, sort of the way I look, looks to me right now, and I, I just wonder, if we were to assume that the agency's prediction for the 23 years is correct, I don't feel quite as good about backing off as much as they did in the 24 year. Say maybe I would go more with what the budget, budget's looking at the 907, then slight growth for the next year up to 935, also with the budget. That would be my feeling as to where we, where I would look at it going. That way we're not quite as ambitious as FIST will do it, but at the same time not quite as negative as the agency. Would you like to make a motion? I'll, I'll make a motion to that effect. Do we need to restate the Just motion? so, um, Madam Chair, so the motion was uh, to go with budget with all three years? Or? No, agency the first year. Okay. So that would be, um, Madam Chair, then the motion would be to go with agencies the, the 936.832 for FY23, uh, and then go with uh, the budget's 907.862 for FY2024, and then uh, budgets for FY25 of 935.883. Uh, uh, Mr. Mr. Levitt, did I get your motion correct? That's correct. Okay, thank you, Madam Chair, for allowing me to clarify the motion for the Do body. we have a second? I'll go ahead and second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? Thank you. Okay, so the next uh, revenue source to, to walk through is the live entertainment tax, and we'll go and start again with Mr. Lawton. Uh, again, for the record, Mike Lawton, Senior Economic Analyst with the Nevada Game Control Board. As you can see in the charts or tables provided to you today, um, the Gaming Control Board's forecast for the live entertainment tax uh, was a slightly increased since our November meeting. Get to my slide, okay. Uh, the primary reasons for this upward revision was a stronger than anticipated October that recorded live entertainment tax collections of $10.4 million, which was an 11.1% or $1 million increase from last October. Additionally, as it always seems to be the case, a new show was announced subsequent to our last meeting, which will run in FY 23 and 24. And not to mention that show was extended even longer, but it's after I've submitted my forecast for this meeting. So uh, that's just the nature of the beast. Very difficult tax to forecast. Um, fiscal year to date, LET collections total $39.2 million and are up 22.5% or $7.2 million. For FY23, we are projecting LET to increase 29.4% or $29.2 million with $128.6 million in collections. This represents a $2.9 million or 2.3% increase from our November meeting. Uh, the growth over the last eight months of FY22 compared to the last eight months of FY21 is an increase of 843.7%. Uh, the average growth required over the last eight months of FY23 to achieve this forecast is a very strong increase of 32.8%. 
In FY24, we are forecasting LET to decrease slightly, uh, 2% or $2.6 million, with $126 million in collections. And then in 25, we are forecasting a decrease of 4.9% or $6.2 million, with $119.9 million in collections. The assumptions used in this forecast have not changed since November, which include the following. The LET forecast models are built on the assumption that in FY23, growth will be achieved by increased showroom capacity occupancy as a result of improved business travel lifting midweek business levels. LET sales have trailed gross gaming revenue growth post-pandemic, as you've noted, and have not peaked due to the lag in business travel compared to that of leisure travel. Midweek group convention business is a key component to LET and its recovery is crucial for production shows and headliners. These performances include multiple shows throughout the week and require large venues to be at maximum capacity in order to be profitable. Additional incremental growth in FY23 is being forecasted due to new programming on the Las Vegas Strip at multiple properties, including the Park MGM, the Wynn Las Vegas, the Venetian, and Caesars. Moving into FY24 and 25, uh, the board feels that because the, the LET, comp LET comparisons will be very difficult due to known programming coming online in FY23 versus unknown programming in the out years of FY24 and 25. It is anticipated that this could result in a gradual decline in collections due to a softening of the average ticket price charged in FY23 in addition to potential moderating in consumer spending. That concludes my discussion, and with that, I can answer any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. Uh, for the record, Jason Gortari, Executive Branch Economist for the Governor's Finance Office. Uh, referencing slide seven, visitation is one of my main drivers for both the gaming and non-gaming side of LET. My forecast assumes increased visitation in the fourth quarter of calendar year 22 compared to the same period in 21. My forecast also assumes increased growth in the number of local residents who spend money on entertainment because of the tight labor market and growth in wages that we're seeing recently and moving forward. Furthermore, the expectation is that the overall trend in Las Vegas visitation continues to increase throughout the forecast period, which is expected to continue if people have disposable income. Fiscal year to date through October, this revenue source is up 21% or nearly 7 million over the year to date amount collected last year. My estimates are largely unchanged from what was presented in November. With another months of data added to this model, a slight upward adjustment was made to fiscal year 23. My forecast elevates in fiscal year 23 to 119.9 million and then steadily increases in fiscal year 24 and 25 to 122.8 million and 124.8 million, respectively. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll turn to uh, Mr. Tower with the presentation of the forecast for the Fiscal Analysis Division. Thank you, Chair Rosenthal. For the record, my name is Christian Tower with the Fiscal Division of the Legislative Council Bureau. Our forum members will find uh, Fiscal's LET forecast on page three of the green table. Um, as concerns the gaming part of the live entertainment tax, <clears throat> Fiscal's December 5th forecast has not changed in any significant way when compared to our November 14th forecast. Our assumptions continue to be that the Las Vegas Strip-based gaming life entertainment is going strong and it will continue to do so um, over the 2023 to 25 biennium. Um, what you see, the slight differences uh, between our November 14th and December 5th forecast are mainly due to drivers like inflation and visitor forecast which as uh, Ms. Mandel of Moody's Analytics has pointed out, these inflation forecasts, for example, have not really changed. They're just in the decimal point, some slight adjustments to the, to the most recent actuals. The same is true for our visitor forecast. And we simply re-ran our model uh, with these updated inflation and visitor numbers and the results 
you see uh, in the table, so which have really very slight difference, differences only from the November 14th forecast. So we end up forecasting um, for fiscal year 2023 the gaming part of the life entertainment tax of $118 million, $297,000. Oh, sorry, $118 million, $297,000. For fiscal year 2024, um, $130 million, $293. And for fiscal year 2025, $136 million, $159,000. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Maybe if I could, um, two more comments. Uh, as Mr. Lawton has pointed out, um, we also looked at the actuals coming in, uh, the last ones, the 10.4 million referenced, and we did not feel the need to make an adjustment to our forecast because that is exactly within the range of what our forecast anticipated. Uh, so th so the, 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 the latest data point in terms of revenues did not incline us to, to make any changes. And then um, maybe a, a final comment, which I, uh, just to put our forecast into perspective, uh, which I made during the last uh, meeting already, the chart you see up there, um, which is on fiscal's meeting page on page 51, um, shows that we're not projecting an increase in dollar span per visitor on an, adjust, an inflation adjusted base. Uh, for gaming life entertainment, as you can see in the in the red graph up there, uh, the blue graph shows our increased projections, which are largely driven by inflation and visitors. Thank you. So uh, this is Linda Rosenthal for the record. Again, just trying to reconcile this back to what we just went through on the the percentage fee tax. So you would think GGR and LAT for gaming somewhat go hand in hand, right? So the underlying assumptions of a peak in 23 and then some moderation in 24 and 25, just given how extreme the, the results have been in the last 20 months, seems to hold with agencies forecast, um, then the, you know, fiscal and, and budget actually have continued growth. So to me, I guess that's the, the main driver of the difference here is we've got one that assumes a peak in 23 and then moderation and other two forecasts that assume starting at a lower spot, but continuing continued growth. Um, that, am I missing something? In For the record, again, Chair Rosenthal, Mike Lawton, uh, Nevada Game Control Board. Yeah, I, I think they do go hand in hand. I think the the, the obvious reason um, LET is more robust than the gaming percentage fees in FY23 is we haven't peaked. Um, you know, it takes a while to ramp up these shows. And um, again, the midweek business is a huge driver for this. And you, you follow the stats on midweek. It's still lagging. It's coming back. And that's going to help drive the forecast along with some incredibly... Um, Amazing new shows, uh, you know, Garth Brooks, Adele, Garth Brooks extended his stay, Maroon 5, and the list goes on and on, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm, that's why I'm comfortable with FY23. Um, I didn't bring it down too, too much in FY24. Um, but again, it, it, there's, there's known programming versus unknown programming. And then on top of that, we have these clouds that we don't know what the impact is going to be. But obviously, the board has taken a position that these clouds are going to interrupt some of this trajectory that we're on. So yeah, I would say the forecast for percentage fees and LET, the, the thought process was the same, just I haven't peaked in FY23 for LET, so it's, it's higher, I guess. Thank you. Any other questions? Someone like to propose a motion or discuss their thoughts? This one's kind of a difficult one. I I mean, let me just throw out my thought about it and see what the rest. My feeling is that if, I, if we go go with agency for the first two years, I'm not don't quite want to go down as much as they did for the third year. So go to budget for the third year. So agency the first two and budget for the third. I don't know. That's 
sort of the way I was looking at it. I was kind of go, uh, Jennifer Lewis, I was also sort of going, I don't want to interrupt you today. <clears throat> but again, I was sort of thinking this similar because I think there's a lot of stuff, I think probably in the works for 2025, but it's too early to even imagine. And then I keep kind of thinking about the recovery even further of the convention business, and we'll sort of see how that goes this coming year, I guess. But so I kind of had the similar thoughts to Marvin. Hi, Vincent Zahn, for the record. Um, could I have Fiscal talk a little bit about the precipitous drop in the 25 forecast? Is it just tough comparisons? Is there something assumed uh, in there from your sure. perspective? Thank you for the question, Chris Antal, for the record, um, with the Fiscal Analysis Division. So um, in line with the percentage fee forecast Mr. Ginnon presented, we also, uh, in, in relation to the uh, gaming part of the LET, we also have a boost due to the special events, Formula One and Super Bowl. And we back, kind of backed that out again in, in fiscal year 2025. And that explains um, the decrease and in increase between fiscal year 2024 and 25. Hope that answers your question. Uh, for the record, Linda Rosenthal, uh, just my thoughts uh, very much aligned with um, the comments that have been made so far, with the exception of, I mean, I just, I know there's known and unknown events, and it's hard to forecast attacks on unknown items, but Vegas always seems to find a way to, to, to bring the shows and the events to, to town to drive this higher. So my only concern is a decline in 25, even though it's a very small decline over what you propose, Mr. Levitt. Um, and, we, and we're not married, just for the new members, we're not married to the forecast on this page. We can also set our own forecast. It can, it can be our own um, uh, number as well. So that would be, that'd be my two cents to add to the consideration. Madam Chairman, I wonder if we align with your comments, if we used agency for the first two years and then used the same number, the 126048 for the third year, where we have that as an equal, is that with that? I'll, I'll make a motion to that effect then. Ms. R Ms. Rosenthal, would you like me to um, specify the motion with the numbers for the record? I'm sure. Thank you, Christian Tao, for the record. So if I understood the motion correctly, um, it would be uh, the forecast for fiscal year 2023, uh, the agency's forecast of $128,602,000. Um, for fiscal year 2024, of $126,048,000, um, uh, and the same number, $126,048,000 for fiscal year 2025. Thank you for restating that. Um, do I have a second? A second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 All opposed? No. Thank you very much. That motion carries. Now we'll move on to the non-gaming portion of the live entertainment Thank tax. You. Good morning, Ms. Scott. Good morning. Whenever you're ready, we'll kick it over to you. Okay. okay. Good morning. For the record, Erica Scott, with uh, economist with the taxation department. Um, We'll start, we'll go through to the live entertainment non-gaming non on slide three. Uh, since the last forum meeting, I spent a bit more time with that forecast and I uh, did add a bit more. Um, I felt my model was a little bit dependent on historic instead of 
uh, items we knew were going to be occurring in the upcoming fiscal year, put more weight onto those. Um, so I did uh, also pulling the fiscal year 23 so far, we've seen some incredible growth. Um, looking at those figures for uh, this first quarter, we're at 19 million for live entertainment tax, uh, non-gaming, which is higher than, I mean, expected. So um, I've padded up my uh, forecast by 15% in fiscal 23, another 30 in fiscal, 30% in fiscal year 24, and another 15% in fiscal year 25 from my last numbers, um, just to acknowledge uh, the growth that we're seeing in this tax type. So uh, with that, it brings us to um, uh, for fiscal year 23, um, that solid growth, uh, and then the big uptick in fiscal year 24 um, due to the large events known like Super Bowl and Formula One, and then leveling out in fiscal year 25. Um, so on slide four, we can see uh, the year over year, um, the growth from our known historic uh, figures. So what that looks like is that uh, revenue collected in FY23 would see the growth of 24% from fiscal year 22. Then fiscal year 24 would see 16% growth off of that um, coming off of fiscal year 23. And then the leveling out in fiscal year 25 of um, a dip of negative 9%. However, uh, that's still, those figures are still record before, you know, prior to fiscal year 22, we're still seeing these strong, uh, strong figures and dollar amounts in LET. Um, and so it's just, we know we're going to see growth in that tax type. It's just a matter of how much we expect it to grow. Um, so with that, I can take any questions or comments. Uh, for the record, Linda Rosenthal, just one quick question. Um, I just have in my notes from the November meeting that I think fiscal had like half of a LET related to the Super Bowl in their forecasts, just not knowing whether there'd be a Nevada team in that or not. And uh, nobody else did, but it sounds like maybe you've changed when you revised your forecast. You do have an assumption for Super Bowl revenue in this tax source in 24? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I did increase that partly due to Super Bowl, but also other well-known events that will be occurring as well. Okay. So not all of the weight is due to Super Bowl. That's just an example. So it's not a event-specific forecast and you sum the parts. It's, it's just a broader generalization about what's going on. Okay, Correct. great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cortari. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Jason Gortari, Executive Branch Economist with the Governor's Finance Office. Uh, referencing slide nine, non-gaming venues tend to attract high revenue events with the additions of T-Mobile Arena, Allegiant Stadium, and other large uh, non-gaming event centers. Las Vegas continues to reinvent and claim its stake to the tourism capital of the world. Not only is Las Vegas an international brand, but it also has the infrastructure to host over 300,000 tourists in a weekend, um, which I believe are two key attributes that's going to land us uh, a lot of events over other metros set up for tourism in the future. Uh, as an example, in fiscal year 23, a few notable events are scheduled to occur in Las Vegas in the same month. There's a Taylor Swift concert at Allegiant, uh, Dell concert, the Sweet 16 and Elite Eight NCAA men's basketball games uh, in fiscal year 24. Um, we're expected to host a Super Bowl. There's also Formula One in fiscal year 24. I think in the news they just announced that um, Las Vegas will be hosting the NCAA men's basketball Final Four tournament in uh, 2028. So um, looking at that long-term outlook, a lot of event planners are bullish on Las Vegas. My forecast assumes visitation will continue to increase over the forecast period, and Las Vegas will continue to launch the, these large-scale events, especially with its expansion into several uh, pro sports leagues and its ability to host um, collegiate championships in the city. Fiscal year to date through October, this revenue source is up nearly 200% and 12 million over the year to date amount collected last year. October's collections came in more than twice the amount of my forecast for that period. 
at 9.8 million as a result. My forecast in fiscal year 23 has about $5 million higher than my previous estimate to account for this month. And I carried that signal forward, increasing my uh, fiscal year 24 and 25 forecast as well by a similar amount. All told, my forecast elevates in fiscal year 23 to 57.8 million and then moderately increases in fiscal year 24 and 25 to 59 million and 59.8 million, respectively. Thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Tower? Thank you, Chair Rosenthal, Christian Tower. Um, the Fiscal Analysis Div Division for the record. Um, our non-gaming December 5th forecast differs when compared with our November 14th forecast by about $9 million or more in each fiscal year. And um, I will try to explain why that is so. Um, first of all, our basic assumptions and outlook in relation to this tax have not changed. Instead, two things happened. First, after the November 14th meeting, I revisited our forecast, redone the analysis, reassessed it, and I found that uh, I had underprojected the first quarter revenues for this tax in fiscal year 2023 by about $3 million. In other words, the takeoff point of my November 14th forecast was about $3 million too low. That was back then, and I corrected that up. Now then, the second thing that happened is we, we received this in September revenues uh, for this tax, um, which we, of course, take into account for our uh, December 5th forecast. And the September revenues came in significantly higher than in any month in the history of this tax before. Right? Just for comparison, to put this in perspective, in the already really strong months of July and August, the non-gaming LET came in at approximately $4.5 million in each month. In September, revenues reached approximately $9.8 million. In other words, the actuals for the first quarter turned out significantly higher, approximately $5 to $6 million, than our upward corrected forecast. And um, consistent with our November 14th forecast, we believe that the entertainment industry in Las Vegas, the stadium, the concert organizers, the music and art festivals will be able to repeat this very strong performance as concerns earnings and taxes in the fiscal years to come. So as a result, our, our December 5th forecast is about $9 million higher in each fiscal year. And then with inflation, everything projecting into uh, fiscal year 2024, then our November 14th forecast. So in a, in a way, we, 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 we upgraded our uh, starting point for the forecast due to the actuals uh, we received. And so, so it ends up with our forecast being um, in fiscal year uh, 2023 of $59,032,000. Then a spike due to the events, Formula One, Super Bowl, uh, you will recall uh, from the November meeting that that plays a significant role uh, in our forecast. Uh, fiscal year 2024, 79, uh, $79 million, uh, $79,385,000. Apologize, and then um, taking out the Super Bowl and taking out the Formula One in fiscal year 2025, um, a drop to 66 million, $16,000. With that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. I'm just trying to understand uh, for, I guess, for 23 and 24, how much are events that have been announced? And I don't know how to best ask this question. How much of this is events that have been announced and how much of this is the unknown piece? I guess that's for all of you in your, in your forecast. Right, so um, in fiscal year 2023, we went through event, the events calendar 
And for example, the T-Mobile Stadium has, as, as far as I could find out, about 17 or 18 events scheduled. And if we compare that to fiscal year, um, the previous fiscal year, 2022, uh, these were, I believe, 11 events. So there are significant, like big concerts in addition to sporting events. Uh, there's a significant difference between fiscal year 22 and 23. Uh, similar uh, in the Allegiant Stadium. And then um, uh, there are a number of additional festivals also planned. Uh, in, in addition to Life is Beautiful, Black, uh, Burning Man, um, and, and all the festivals we know, there are additional festivals planned. And, and our forecast is based on taking these one by one into account. And then the, the assumption is that this can be repeated and will be repeated in the fiscal years to come because we believe looking at the, the, uh, looking at, uh, the significant taxpayers in this tax, we believe they have learned on how to make this work. And they will seek and try to, to reproduce this. And so far we have no indication for that they can't do this. Thank you. That, that, that at least is our belief that is reflected in this forecast. And from taxation standpoint, this is Erica Scott, economist with taxation for the record. So our assumption is, so we know what's upcoming for the most part, fiscal 23, fiscal year 24, with large one-time events as well. But for fiscal year 25, our, our assumption is, is, is stabilization with the, um, the large uh, concert uh, venues that are just consistent with their, with their um, their concerts, their acts that are upcoming. Of course, we aren't aware of all of them, or they haven't been announced yet. But we are we are betting that they're pretty consistent. Thank Sorry, you. one oh. second. Can I just a clarification on that? So the decline in twenty five then is just really removing like an F one or a Super Bowl, and then assuming the the concert calendar stays somewhat consistent. Correct. Okay, sure. Thank you. Thank Sorry, you. Go ahead, Mr. Rotter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Jason Gortari. Um, yeah, pretty much to complement um, what the other two forecasters uh, have said, um, my fiscal year 22, um, my fiscal year 23 is built off my fiscal year 22 uh, forecast. And then as each event is announced, it's adjusted upward. Um, and then looking into Fiscal year 25, uh, a lot of that is unknown, but it's under the assumption that we'll continue to land these same events um, that we did in fiscal year 23 and 24, along with uh, similar events to the one-time uh, Super Bowls or Formula One events uh, looking into the future. So one question, you said it's so as events are announced, you're adding that event or you're just plugging it into an unknown that you already had? Plugging it into an unknown that I already had. Oh, so you're not adding an additional event when you see another? Amplifying the, the growth factor. Okay. Um, yeah, okay. Got it. Any other questions? Someone like to make a motion? Try it. <laughs> Okay, the, I feel pretty good about it. fiscal 23 and 25. I'm a little bit concerned that in 24, there's so substantially more than the other two. And so it just seems to me that we can just arbitrarily pick, say, 60 million for the 20 four fiscal year and then 66 million for the next one. I'm a little bit concerned that th that seems so high in relation to the other two for that s second fiscal year. I don't know what, what, what the others feel about that. I think the, um, oh, sorry, Michael Chrome, the 2023, so you're saying, are you, I just want to clarify, you're saying the fiscal, so the 59 million that we have in, in 23? Uh, I, Concerned, I think there there definitely is um, increased demand, um, and there will be increased shows. But I think also what we saw this year was a lot of the pent up um, demand for shows coming back, um, and so it feels a little bit aggressive. I was more thinking around the budget number, uh, the budget divisions number of fifty seven, and then 
moving up to the, I guess it would be 59 with the budget division for for uh, fiscal year 24. And then I'm, I'm comfortable with what we're looking at in fiscal year 25. I share your concerns about this. I think we're a little aggressive on the Super Bowl. Linda Rosenthal, for the record, uh, can we? Can I just ask the Super Bowl and F one? Do we have an estimate in dollars of what that might contribute, just so we can kind of back that out and get a normal kind of growth growth trajectory again, and then add that in as a known event in one specific year? If you give me one one or an minute, an yeah. just an estimate. <laughs> yeah, so that's a big ask. I, not at all. Um, That's just your stuff because the interest is not really. So we did a calculation um, based on uh, a visitor estimate uh, with a with a ticket estimate of what the average ticket price might be. And if we, if we think, for example, that um, the Formula One would sell 100,000 tickets and they would go at an average price of $1,300, um, which, according to research we did, is not an unrealistic price, um, that would turn out to be $11.7 million in tax revenues. And if we look at something similar from the, for the Super Bowl, let's say 65,000 tickets. If we, according to research, the average ticket price of $2,500 seems to be realistic, and that would turn out to be $7.3 million in tax revenues. Um, and that, that, is, that, that was my calculation with it. Um, maybe that is over-optimistic. I understand that because you have to balance it with other events anyways taking place, also this fiscal year. Um, but that was my thought process behind this. Sorry, and then the, the tax rate on that 19 or $20 million in revenue would be? The tax, the, the, what the would the tax, tax be? Yeah. The tax rate is for the LET non-gaming is 9% on the gross ticket price. Kacentau for the record. So it's a couple million dollars in incremental tax revenue for this tax, not 20 million, right? The 20 million is your estimated revenue for the event, and then you've got to apply the 9% tax rate? No, th that is with the 9% oh, okay. tax rate. That okay. is okay. the 9% so tax okay. rate. Okay. That is the 9% tax rate. Okay, so 19 million ish for yeah. those two events. Correct. They're justified, there should be a spike. Yeah, in 24. And then without. Intel. I know people are speculating the F1 will come back, but I don't know how frequently, and it's obviously not a given. You know, maybe that comes back down, and and you've got this either consistent or slow growing base on the the other items like the concerts. Okay, given all that, <laughs> do we have a revised motion? Yeah, we're gonna ask where are we at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we're. I don't have a revised motion. I'm, I'm wondering where we are. <laughs> Go ahead, Marvin. Okay, what if we had go with the fiscal division, 59 for the first year, and because of the activity we already know about, going up to 65 million in the second year and then dropping back down to budget's number of 59 in the third year? I don't know, how does that sound to everyone? Okay, so uh, do you do you want to summarize the motion, Mr. Tower? Do you I'd be happy to do so if, if you wish to do so, uh, if you wish me to do so, Chair Rosenthal. Thank you, Christian Tower, for the record. So, if I understood the motion correctly, um, the forecast for fiscal year 2023 would be the, the one of the fiscal analysis division of 59 million 32 thousand dollars. 
in fiscal year 2024 of $65 million, and in fiscal year 2025, going with the budget division's forecast of $59,842. That is correct. Um, Linda Rosenthal, for the record. So just one one comment. I think we're getting we're getting much closer, but I mean, I don't think the math seems unrealistic for what the fiscal analysis division did in terms of the specific revenue that will be driven by the two unique events in 24. We're only increasing the the forecast six million, and it's you know 19 million dollar from those two events. So assuming a decline then in concerts and other things. So my only consideration would be to um, have 24 spike a bit a bit higher to to recognize the it doesn't have to be 100 percent of the number but I think it's substantially closer to the to the number that uh, the 19 million dollar number that was estimated for those two events and then coming coming back down without the repeat of those events but um, showing moderate growth in concerts or, or, or flats so the 59 to the 59 to the 59 eight I don't have a problem with I just think it's going to be higher in 24. What if we went to a 70 million in 24 then instead of 65 would that be Closer to what you're. Yeah, I, I mean, I, it's better. I still think it's low. I mean, I, I just think we have pretty, pretty uh, rational estimate of the 19 million. Um, so what if we did like if so it was 15 of the 19? It's not even all of it. That would take you from, or just make it an easy say. Say it was, you know, 75, right? 75 or so in 24, and then it comes back down. Okay. That goes from 59 to 75. Yeah, if, you feel, if you feel better with 75, that's, I'm, I'm agreeable to that. <laughs> um, any, any further discussion on the... the any further comments on the discussion that's taking place about raising um, the motion that's on the table in fiscal 24 to 75 million? Yeah, 75. It's Michael Chrome. I, I still believe the 75 is a bit aggressive. Okay. Um, I'd, I'd be more comfortable settling in it. I think we said 65 before. I'd be comfortable if we said 70, but I think that's for me. Um, I'm comfortable there. And then I guess 59 in 2025. Is that what, is that what you said? What, what did you say for 25? 59. The, he said the 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 budget. So 59.8. So yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Kind of concur, uh, Jennifer Lewis. But I'd concur a little bit with the 70 million. I think <clears throat> at some point there's like a golden goose. I'd be afraid of at some point ticket prices, and there's only so much room capacity. I mean, there's new rooms underway, but not that many to fill everything up. So <clears throat> I just would be, if, if someone can't find a room there, they're not going to Formula One or they're camping or whatever. But at some point, there's a golden goose, I think. And so I think I'm more comfortable with the 70 million. Okay, so I believe we have a revised motion, uh, which is... For fiscal 23, 59 million 32, the fiscal division forecast. For FY 24, 70 million even. And for fiscal 25, it's the budget division forecast of 59,842. <clears throat> Do I have a second? A second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion carries. Okay. Uh, still on agenda item six, um, subsection C, the state 2% sales tax will be next. Ms. Scott, whenever you're ready, you can uh, start us off. Good afternoon, uh, Erica Scott, again, uh, economist with Taxation for the record. Um, my forecast for the 2% sales tax did not change, although I do have kind of a, a slide, um, num slide number six 
will show so far into the year where we're at, which is my reasoning for why I'm not changing my, my forecast. Um, so we are in and around that, um, you know, it was, it was a growth of 6.5% in July, 11.3% in August, and then 9.4% in, um, in September. Um, my assumption, our assumptions from taxation is that there could be some slowing in spending. Um, and so I, I believe my, my forecast of the, um, the, 7%, 7 percent, 7.1% is is fair, and so that's what I was going to stick with for this um, this meeting. Um, and with that, I can open it up to any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. Gotari. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Jason Gotari. Executive Branch Economist with Governor's Finance Office. I'll now discuss my 2% sales and use tax. Uh, please refer to slide 11. And let's take a look at inflation by level one components. All eight major groups are starting to dip down slightly in October, but still remain stubbornly high in some categories. Housing dipped below 8%, and transportation, the second biggest CPI component, is back down to 11%, nearly half of the March 2022 number, which printed at 22% inflation. Food and beverage still remain stubbornly high at 10.5%. And then if you look at medical care, apparel, recreation, these are all in the 4 to 5% range, with almost all groups elevated from their January 21 numbers. Next, slide 12. Uh, shows the main drivers of the headline inflation number by CPI category. The weight represents the specific group share of the total inflation number, and the lines on the left show the non-seasonally adjusted index time series of the CPI category dating back to 1990, with the green dot on the line representing the series all-time high. As you can see over the past year or so, the green dot is close to the end of the line, meaning that category's index is the highest it's been in quite some time, or the highest it's ever been. Um, the top four drivers of inflation are housing, which represents about 35 to 40 percent of the headline number, transportation at 18 percent, food and beverage at 14 percent, and medical care at 9 percent. Collectively, these groups account for over 80 percent of the total inflation number. So as long as these four categories remain high and far above the target inflation rate, the headline inflation number will remain elevated too. While there's some room for improvement, uh, to taming inflation, there's still a lot of work to do. Turning to slide 13, with all that in mind, fortunately, sales tax serves somewhat as a hedge to inflation. With inflation increasing to over 8% uh, this year and almost all inflation categories elevated far above their 2021 numbers, an upward adjustment to goods has resulted in higher prices and therefore higher collections. This is demonstrated in the taxable retail sales over the year collections, which have increased over the year for about the past 20 months. Turning to slide 14, you can see the top 12 taxable retail sales revenue generating industries in Nevada. The dashed lines on the facet chart are the current taxable retail sales amounts as of September of 2022, and the charts are ordered from top rank to 12th rank, left to right. Next, if you look at non-store retailers, which is fifth in line on the chart from 2018 to 2022, non-store retailers have shot up, averaging the 11th or 12th largest taxable sales source to the fifth, increasing by nearly 400 million over four years and is trending on a vertical path as remote retailers and marketplace facilitators increase their market share in the overall retail space. Turning to slide 15, uh, with all that in mind, I believe this revenue source has realized a new normal. I used a regression model to forecast retail sales driven by variables such as visitation, employment, wages, and total gaming volume. Uh, my forecasts are slightly stronger from when we met in November after adjusting for the year-to-date actuals. Uh, my estimates steadily increased throughout the forecast period with collections coming in at $1.75 billion, uh, $1.85 billion in fiscal year 24, and then 1.9 billion in fiscal year 25. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Gindon. 
Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Russell Gindon with the Fiscal Analysis Division. And the, the taxable sales uh, for the Fiscal Analysis Division actually begins on page 53 of the Fiscal Division packet. And so as a precursor to actually going through, uh, as I stated, right, our economic outlook really didn't change. So what's going on in terms of consideration is we got the September taxable sales and thus the September sales tax collections. Um, and so last time when we were forecasting the quarter, we know two-thirds of the quarter, so we're really forecasting September. So uh, September's taxable sales came in at 9.4%, which I was expecting 9.1, which is pretty close in forecasting business. Unfortunately, the the tax the, the collections only grew 7.2%, uh, so about 2% less. But And that can happen because there can be a variance between the taxable sales reported and the collections due to they are, there are uh, diversions for uh, tourism improvement districts and economic diversification districts for the Tesla uh, pack, uh, project, the Gigafactory project, as well as you can just have variances due to accounting things that go on for people filing and, and, and not paying the correct amount. But that took me by surprise to have the 2% gap between. So thus, uh, I missed the first quarter, right? I got the taxable sales, I missed the collections. So I had to make an adjustment downward for the first quarter because I now know the actual. Uh, then we know the October visitor numbers. Uh, they were stronger than what I thought. So thus the October, November, December, the visitors was revised up a little bit. So that brings the second quarter of FY23 up a little bit. So you can see looking at table eight, the, the net effect is it's a slight downward revision. Why? Because it was about a $4 million negative uh, adjustment because of I had taxable sales growing or collections growing by the 9%, not the 7%. So when you look at the fiscal divisions there in Table 8, it's a downward revision in the forecast by only 264000 basically unchanged. Because missing September and then the visitors being stronger for October, thinking that should translate into taxable sales also, then that's, that's FY23. Then moving into FY24, there, there really wasn't a change, and there really shouldn't be much change. Uh, and so I'm going to apologize that you do this and then put it away. And then this morning, looking to it, uh, I'm like, what's going on with the 2023 third quarter? So that would be the first quarter of FY23. And so I'll just I'll bring it up here quickly uh, to show... I won't spend a lot of time on it, but uh, if you, so you're looking at table three in, in the 2023 third quarter here, you can see that it grows by 6.9%, uh, but when you go over the difference, right, it's actually increasing, and that's what threw me. That shouldn't happen. So s somehow bad numbers got into the presentation tables compared to what the forecast was, because that should actually be basically 448.8 here, not 453. So it was unchanged. So basically, really not, it was the front end, and then there's just a little bit of adjustment. So uh, in FY20, in, in table eight, for FY24, the forecast should be 1843.322. 1843.322, which is actually a 6.6% .6 increase over the FY23 forecast. But it's a downward revision of approximately $1.5 million. And then, then because the error in 23 propagated 2023, uh, excuse me, 2023 third quarter propagated forward into 2023, 2024 third quarter, then the, the forecast for FY23 that you're seeing in Table 8 should be 1929 Point four two two. That's one nine two nine point four two two, which is actually a downward revision of approximately seven point three million, not the three million that you see there. Uh, and so, thus, the reason for you can see twenty four is just a slight word downward revision, and part of the the adjustment uh, in FY twenty four for the downward was when going looking at it, what Moody's uh, forecast was for inflation, the rate of inflation starting to subside. And I just thought I had a little bit too much real growth 
that was occurring in the quarters, especially around for the F1 and the, the Super Bowl. Not that I still don't have growth, as you can see, uh, looking at the table I have on the screen, but it, it just uh, it was backed off a little bit. Uh, and so then, uh, com continuing into the four quarters FY 2025, there I, looking at it after having a chance to revisit, I think I, I still had, two, I wasn't backing off enough because I'm not assuming I'll have F1 in the Super Bowl in FY25. And with inflation, the rate of inflation coming down in the low twos, I just had too much real growth, I believe, occurring in FY 2025. And so, again, the table I have on the screen, you can see pulling back on those quarters. So, Madam Chair, members of the forum, that's fiscal forecast. Again, I apologize for having to change the numbers on you, but I noticed it at about 8.50 this morning and was frantically trying to figure it out before coming over here. But thus, you can see that would, that would, it does change fiscal's uh, path a little bit with regards, rather than it being an upward revision, it's a slight downward revision in FY 2024, and then a larger downward revision in FY 2025 due to further reasons I've stated. With that, I can answer any questions that the members have. Thank you. Thank you. Linda Rosenthal, for the record. So sorry, I got a little lost there with years and numbers. Was the the billion eight forty three three twenty two. Which year was that for? That is FY twenty four. So it would be okay. the one seven two nine point nine six six that you see listed in Table eight for FY twenty three, and for FY twenty four it would be the one eight four three point three two two, and then for FY twenty five it would be the one nine two nine point four two two. Thank you very much for that clarification. Any questions? You know, it looked look like to me we've got we got several things at, at work here at the same time. One thing, of course, we've got inflation, which we is has a direct effect on sales tax. Of course, has been discussed. The second thing I think is that we have certain components of the sales tax that are based on people's feeling about the future economy. Say, for instance. If you go to purchase a vehicle and you think things are going to go bad, then you probably delay that purchase. So you've got some give and take there. I think another thing that I suppose looks to advantage on the sales taxes that we, from the numbers we saw by Moody's when they put them up, people have accumulated some assets. And the sales tax, the things that are subject to sales tax are the most likely things where they would use those assets for the f for the future now based on that then I would I would think we have we're going to see f based on those factors we're going to see fairly good growth and even in the 24 fiscal year even if we start to have an, a recession I'm not quite so assured on the 25 fiscal year so that re that regard, I would th I would think that we, we could go with fiscal for the first two years, and then go slightly less than that down to one point nine two five, which is the agency one for the third fiscal year. I don't know how everyone else feels about that. Would you like to pose that as a motion? Uh, I'll, I'll make that as a motion. <laughs> Go ahead and second that. That was kind of my thoughts also. Mr. Gindin, do you want to repeat the motion for? Yes, Madam Chair, because, uh, again, just because I'm the one that messed up the numbers, so I better try and get it right. Uh, so uh, as I understand Mr. Levitt's uh, motion, it would be to go with fiscal division's forecast for FY23, the 1729.966. The FY24 revised forecast that I provided you, the 1843.322. And then uh, budgets, excuse me, agencies forecast for FY25 of 1925.377. Uh, hopefully I, I got Mr. Lovett's motion correctly. That's correct. Thank you. So we have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Motion carries. Now we'll turn to the insurance premium tax. And again, we'll start with Ms. Scott whenever you're ready. Uh, 
Thank you. Erica Scott for the record. Um, so for the, the forecast for insurance premium tax, um, if we go to slide nine, I had not changed my forecast for this one just because my model was based on historical growth, which is pretty consistent. So um, we're coming in at the 532 million on the um, fiscal year 2023, 563 million on fiscal year 24, and 594 million on fiscal year 25. Um, so with that, I would be open to any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Gortari. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Jason Gortari, Executive Branch Economist for the Governor's Finance Office. Uh, please refer to slide 17 for my insurance premium tax forecast. The insurance premium tax is a relatively stable revenue source for the state and is not subject uh, to fluctuations as much as the taxes that are closely aligned with tourism and spending, like the uh, gamage percentage fee collections or the live entertainment taxes. I estimated the IPT revenue with aggression model based on households, medical CPI, and the 10-year treasury rate. Uh, with no new data coming in for this revenue source, my forecasts are identical from when we last met in November. My forecast steadily increases throughout the forecast period with collections coming in at 569 million in fiscal year 23, 612 million in fiscal year 24, and 657.9 million in fiscal year 25. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Nakamoto. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Michael Nakamoto with the Fiscal Analysis Division. Um, as a usual reminder on the insurance premium tax, um, just to back up to Ms. Scott's uh, numbers that she presented, there is always an addition of an around $20, $21 million from the insurance division of the Department of Business and Industry for the surplus lines portion that they collect, which is why the numbers in her presentation do not match what you have in Table 8. Uh, that having been said, uh, the Fiscal Analysis Division is going to sound a little bit like a broken record with respect to our forecast. Um, as Mr. Gindin noted at the beginning of this agenda item with respect to the actual collections, we do not have actual collections for the first quarter. Uh, we normally would, um, but because of the issues the Department of Taxation uh, came across, we don't. Um, thus, with very minor, if even recognizable, changes to uh, personal income and a lot of our economic economic outlook. Um, the Fiscal Analysis Division has not changed our forecast for the insurance premium tax. Based on the information that we've gotten from the insurance division and the Silver State Health Insurance Exchange on um, health insurance rates, and that's about 40 percent of the insurance market right now, um, and just the general pattern with this tax that it is relatively recession-proof. If I had you turn to page 74 of uh, the fiscal packet, you can look at insurance premium tax collections as a, as a line chart. And it, with the exception of the Great Recession, it just basically goes up. And so we have uh, growth in anywhere between 5.4 and 5.8% throughout the forecast horizon, which we think is reasonable given this tax. And again, there are no changes to our forecast, and I'd be glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. I was going to make a motion. Yes, please. Make a motion that uh, I think I'm comfortable with all the fiscal division numbers, the 570, 603, and the 636 in 2023, 24, 24 and 25, respectively. That's my motion. Go ahead and second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 Okay, the motion carries. Next, we'll turn to the modified business tax. Erica Scott, for the record, um, 
for modified business tax. We've seen strong employment in Nevada. Um, my model from the last meeting, I had noticed I did need to work with that a bit. I think we discussed that. So I did um, work on that model with matching some of the wage and salary disbursement data that Moody's provides um, updated uh, just this last November. So um, the estimated growth rate uh, in the wage and salary disbursement is a mid to high 6% rates for fiscal year 23, 24, and 25 in and around that range. So I have adjusted my modified business tax figures. So for fiscal year um, 2023, my forecast came in at uh, 792.83 million. Um, and then of course I, I provided figures prior to the um, the known modified business tax rate reduction that's taking effect in fiscal year 2024. So prior to that, we would have seen growth in modified business tax of up to uh, 842 million in fiscal year 2024 and then 898 million in fiscal year 25. Um, and then on the next slide, I have the graph with the, um, the rate reduction for, um, and of course this is for modified business tax, general business, sorry. Um, and so when we factor in that the rate reduction, then we're looking at of course the same uh, 792 million for FY23, then uh, 715 million for FY24 and 763 million for FY25. Um, and then moving into the modified business tax financial um, category, um, that's on slide 12. Um, I also utilized the Moody's wage and salary disbursement and also added a component of the financial sector employment. Um, and with that, we come in at 49 million for FY23, 52 million for FY24, and then 56 million for FY25. And then on the next slide, we factor in the modified business tax rate reduction. So that FY24 goes down to 44 million and then 47 million in FY25. So for um, modified business tax mining, um, I did run similar factors, but also um, added in the component of, of um, natural resources employment, um, and looked at those trends, which again, estimate about 6% employment growth. So my numbers for uh, modified business tax mining came in at 22 million for FY23, uh, 23 million for FY24, and 24 million for FY25. And then of course, factoring in the rate reduction, then it drops down to 19 million in FY24 and 20 million in FY25. And so with that, I'd be, um, well, uh, the next slide shows the overall, overall modified business tax um, growth in FY23, and then of course the reduction in FY24 due to the modified business tax rate reduction. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Mr. Gortari. Thank you, Thank you Chair Rosenthal. For the record, Jason Gortari, Executive Branch Economist with the Governor's Finance Office. Uh, please refer to uh, my modified business tax uh, forecast for the general business or non-financial, which starts on slide 19. On slide 19, I provide a general business, business employment forecast. My forecast shows steady increases in employment throughout the forecast period. Nevada has surpassed its pre-pandemic job peak and continues to add jobs. As of data of October of 2022, uh, total non-farm is up 22,200 jobs from its pre-pandemic peak, and the private sector is up 28,500 from the pre-pandemic pre peak. The unemployment rate also remains relatively low at 4.6%. It's also important to note that post-pandemic a shift has taken place in Nevada's labor market. Uh, while the leisure and hospitality industry is still down 30,000 jobs, manufacturing, transportation, and warehousing are up 30,000 collectively, with average weekly wages in both these industries more than doubling those of leisure and hospitality. For my 
MBT general business collections, slide 20 shows my forecast. The red bars represent the actual revenue forecast and the green bars represent the revenue forecast with before the MBT rate buy down. With no new data coming in for this revenue source my new or new signals indicating a different direction, my forecasts are identical from when we last met in November. Under the old rates, my estimates steadily increased throughout the forecast period uh, with $828.7 million in fiscal year 23, $877.6 million in fiscal year 24, and $929.4 million in fiscal year 25. However, after accounting for the MBT rate buy-down, the fiscal year 24 and 25 amounts will be $745.1 million and $789.1 million, respectively, as seen in the red bars, or about $130 million less in each fiscal year. Uh, next, moving on to my modified business tax forecast for financial institutions. My forecast starts with a financial employment outlook starting on slide 22. Employment data through October shows that the financial industry employment is above its pre-pandemic peak. However, the CES, or Current Employment Statistics Survey, put out by the Bureau of Labor Statistics shows that October's employment reported a decline of 1,100 jobs over the month in this industry in the state. Using this as a signal and carrying it forward, I reduced my financial employment forecast. I used Moody's baseline scenario forecast instead of Dieter's, which um, has slower growth in fiscal year 23, negative growth in fiscal year 24, and slight growth in fiscal year 25. Next, looking at slide 23, this chart shows the mortgage applications index and the 30-year fixed mortgage rate, which provides a snapshot view of consumer demand for mortgage loans. As rates go up, mortgage applications go down. As rates have eased off the 7% mark recently, mortgage applications have bounced back a bit too and are up 9% over the week as of November 21st of 2022. However, uh, mortgage pur purchase applications have contracted about 52% from the seasonally adjusted peak in early 2021 or January 11th of 2021. Since then, roughly Every one percentage point increase in the mortgage rates is associated with a 17% decrease in mortgage applications. This is important for MBT financial revenue collections because lower demand for mortgages will in part attribute to a slowdown in employment and wages and commissions in the financial activities sector, especially in a market where refinancing doesn't make much sense for existing home owners either. Finally, page 24 summarizes my MBT financial collections forecast. I made a downward revision to budgets estimates after considering October's reduction in employment in the financial activities sector and with the large decrease in U.S. mortgage applications from 2021. Under the old rates, my estimates moderately increased throughout the forecast period with collections coming in at $42.5 million in fiscal year 23, 47.6 million in fiscal year 24, and 49.2 million in fiscal year 25. However, after accounting for the MBT rate buy down, the fiscal year 24 and 25 amounts will roughly be 39.9 million and 41.2 million, respectively, as seen in the red bars, or about 8 or 9 million less in each fiscal year. Moving on to modified business tax for mining institutions. This uh, starts on slide 26. Employment in the mining sector tends to follow the trend of gold prices, which are currently hovering at an all-time high. The mining industry's average weekly wages are the highest in the state at 2,700 per week, and employment is expected to remain stable in the industry over the forecast period. Next, age 27 summarizes my MBT mining collections forecast. With no new data coming in for this revenue source or new signals and are indicating a different direction, my forecasts are identical from when we last met in November. Under the old rates, my estimates moderately increased through the forecast period with collections coming in at $21.8 million in fiscal year 23, $22.4 million in fiscal year 24, and $23.1 million in fiscal year 25. However, after accounting for the MBT rate buy-down, the fiscal year 24 and 25 amounts will be $18.8 million and $19.4 million, respectively, seen in the red bars, or about $2 million less um, after the buy-down in each fiscal year. 
And with that, that concludes um, my MBT forecast. If, I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Powers? Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, Susanna Powers, um, Deputy Fiscal Analyst with the uh, Fiscal Analysis Division. And just a second. The tax rate will change on all types of MPT effective fiscal 24. Uh, table 1 on page 67 of the Economic Forum hardcover packet compares our individual MPT forecasts across the fiscal years when keeping the tax rate unchanged. There were few minor revisions to our employment forecasts resulting from one additional month of jobs data released by the Bureau of Labor Statistics on November 18th. Monthly job reports have continued to show a strong labor market in Nevada. In the near term, we expect inflationary pressures on wages, but as inflation decelerates, the wage growth should ease. Our fiscal 23 forecasts for the non-financial and mining sectors had slight upward revisions due to a better than expected monthly jobs report in November. Interest rate sensitive areas of the financial sector are experiencing some softening. For the financial sector, our fiscal 23 MPT forecast had a slight downward revision due to a larger than expected decline in jobs in November compared to the prior month. Assuming the Federal Reserve will soft land the economy, we should expect to see some softening in the labor market and wage growth in fiscal 24 compared to the prior fiscal year, reflected in our forecast. Then in fiscal 25, the economic activity and metrics associated with this tax are expected to normalize. Turn to Table 8, the green sheet MPT forecast page. Uh, that table will display the mathematical calculations needed to translate the forecast I just presented to you to account for the impact of the reduced tax rates, effective fiscal 24. You can also see the minor revisions to our MPT non-financial, financial, and mining forecasts from our prior meeting. They were really minor. This does conclude my presentation, but I would be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. It looks like to me that most of the cases were fairly close on this tax, and I fiscal division sort of in the middle on most of them. And so I'd make a motion that we accept the fiscal division for all three taxes for all three years. A second. Do you, Ms. I think that's pretty clear. I didn't know, Ms. Powers, if you wanted to, to reiterate the motion. I think it, it, it's so straightforward. We're okay? Madam Chair, I think it was very clear. <laughs> uh, I believe the motion was to accept the fiscal division forecast for all types of uh, MPT uh, for all three years. That is correct. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That motion passes. Great, moving on to the real property transfer tax. We'll turn it over to you, Ms. Scott, when you're ready. Thank you, Ms. Chair. So for the real property transfer tax, um, this tax type I spent a lot more time with after our last meeting, um, pulling many, many different economic indicators from Moody's and having any kind of real trend for this tax type was pretty difficult. So what I've done here is um, 
we do know that the real property transfer tax is down um, this from this time last year um, by about 23%. Um, and this is due to rising interest rates and, and the, the mortgage originations is, is down. Um, the cost of borrowing is, is up and the housing market has seen a drop in sales directly affecting this tax type. However, there is some hopeful expectations that the interest rates will stabilize in the upcoming fiscal years in 24 and 25. We're um, looking for this to happen to at least stabilize this tax type. Um, so for my model, I have dropped down the uh, fiscal year 23 um, forecast for this tax to be 131 million. Um, hopefully see some recovery in FY24 of $140 million, and then in fiscal year 25, stabilizing into the uh, $150 million. Of course, all three fiscal years, we'd see uh, much more reduced from the FY2022, um, that growth that we saw in the housing division there. So um, with that, I would open this up to questions if you have any. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Gortari. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Jason Gortari, Executive Branch Economist for the Governor's Finance Office. I'll now discuss my real property transfer tax forecast. Slides 29 provide some historical context on single-family permits in Nevada, both on a calendar year and fiscal year basis. Housing starts in fiscal year 22, or the most we'd seen since 2007, as you can see on the bottom chart. If you look at the top monthly part, at the start of calendar year 21, which is the red dot, builders seem to be set on working on digging us out of the hole we created from 2008 to 2012. Recently, it appears the higher interest rates have spooked builders a bit, uh, indicated by the October of 2022 number, or the blue dot, uh, but it didn't discourage them enough to drop to those 08 to 2012 low levels. Next, slide 30 provides a forecast for single family housing permits in the state. Assuming the feds get a hold of inflation during the forecast period, housing permits should see a dip in fiscal year 23 and pick up for the remainder of the forecast period. Next, slide 31, Nevada's historical 12 month percent change in the housing price index. The annotations represent point-to-point 16-month point decelerations, or the uh, black dash lines and black numbers, with the last uh, only showing a nine-month to current deceleration. While it's highly unlikely that these periods are analogous of the current period, I believe they serve as a useful reference to form an opinion of the current rate of growth. Uh, while I don't think we'll follow the major deceleration that we did from 2005 to 2010, I think it could be somewhere in the middle. Uh, since we last met, uh, that number's dropped from 9.3% to 4.5% appreciation. Next, uh, my estimates for HPI growth are represented on slide 32, which roughly forecast a 15% decrease in the housing price index from 2022 uh, to the end of the forecast period, or fiscal year 25. Slide 33 provides some historical context on the U.S. average 30-year fixed mortgage rates. In October of 2022, the 30-year fixed mortgage rates reached their highest rates in over 20 years. The last time the rate was higher was in March of 2002. However, the rate has decreased half a percent in November of 2022 and has decreased slightly to under 6.5% as of December 1st of this year. Turning to slide 34, this chart shows year-to-date change in the 30-year fixed mortgage rates by year. The gray faded lines represent all years from 1972 to 2022, except for 2022, which is in blue, and then 1981, which is in red. I picked out 1981 because the pattern of rate changes in 2022 have roughly been following 1981s, especially after week 20 of the year. If this pattern holds true to finish the year, mortgage rates will be about 2% higher than they were last year, putting us in a 5%-ish uh, range for the 30-year fixed mortgage rate by the end of this month. Next, uh, slide 35 and 36 show a projection of existing home sales in Nevada on a calendar year and fiscal year basis. 
the forecast expect existing home sales to, to go, decline in the first year of the forecast period due to the impact of the relatively high 30-year fixed mortgage rates and then are expected to increase in the final two years with the expectation that the mortgage rates will continue to improve over the next two fiscal years. And with that, looking at slide 37, the real property transfer tax is a function of sales volume and price driven largely by the residential retail sector. First quarter collections for fiscal year 23 were down about 20% over the year, as Ms. Scott indicated. After a careful review of my assumptions, I revised the real property, trans tax, real property transfer tax forecast down, still holding the expectation that building will rebound, home prices won't bottom out, and mortgage rates will continue to decline over the forecast period, but at a little bit slower pace than I initially anticipated at our November meeting. I forecasted collections to come in at $45 million for fiscal year 23, and then I have them picking up in fiscal year 24 and 25, coming in at $155.5 million and $165.3 million, respectively. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you. Mr. Nakamoto? Thank you, Madam Chair. Again, for the record, Michael Nakamoto with the Fiscal Analysis Division. Um, for the real property transfer tax, if you look at Table 8, um, you'll see that we have made very m minor revisions to the, uh, the forecast, and that is wholly attributable to the first quarter of the fiscal year. Uh, when I did this presentation back on November 14th, we knew 16 of the 17 counties um, and so we had the number of approximately 33.5 million, um, give or take. Uh, it turned out that the county that we were waiting for did not report their collections by the time that the Department of Taxation released the first quarter number, um, but they have since um, put that number in, or we have that number. And so basically the revision of $167,000 to FY23 was because Story County reported uh, $167,000 more collections than I had anticipated as part of the forecast. Um, the story otherwise is the same. We have not changed our outlook on housing. Um, I think uh, Ms. Lewis would love uh, for the, uh, the housing outlook to be as optimistic as um, either Mr. Gortari or Ms. Scott have it. Um, we frankly don't think it is. Um, I think looking at Moody's forecasts for the 30-year um, interest rate, they still have it increasing um, going into 2023 and not falling until you get later into 2023 and even into 2024 to the point where we may not even be below 7% by 2025. Um, so looking at that, looking at prices, which I think still are um, a little bit inflated based on all of the, the um, pandemic activity that was going on, as I think I noted at the last meeting, um, there were significant observations of people um, in certain markets, especially in the West Coast, so Seattle and Phoenix and Boise and Las Vegas and Reno were among them, um, where you saw these great appreciations of prices because people who were no longer tethered to a workplace in, in California or, or, or elsewhere could move to somewhere that was more affordable. And I think uh, Reno and Las Vegas in particular are seeing the effects of that, and it's going to be a while before um, things correct to that um, aspect. So when you look at our FY24 forecast in comparison to what you've seen in the history, um, especially on page 108 of the fiscal packet, you can see the historical collections um, getting us down to $105.3 million. That's pretty close to what we were seeing pre-pandemic. So you saw $103.4 million in FY28, $101 million in FY29, and $100.3 million in FY20. That is, I think, where the market's got to settle back to is back at the levels where we were in terms of the revenue. It's going to be at a higher price, I think, but with a, a lower demand uh, just a, as the interest rates um, start settling out um, because without originations, you're not going to have transfers. So that's kind of where we see this. Um, and then you grow out of it as you stabilize the inflation rate and you start picking up some activity and prices should appreciate as you go along with that. Um, so with that, Madam Chair, that is our story is the same as it was um, a few weeks ago. And with that, I'd answer any questions. Thank you.
For the record, Linda Rosenthal, just a quick question, if you can remind me, um, the growth uh, back into 25, you know, you're, you're saying, you know, things get a little more stabilized. You also mentioned that potentially per Moody's forecast, interest rates are still very high. Um, just, just questioning in my mind that that recovery and that growth into 25 off of the 24. Um, for the record, Michael Nakamoto with Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, Moody's forecasts for the 30-year um, fixed rate, it, it falls down into that mid-five range, so about 5.5% when you start getting out into calendar year 25. Um, so with the rates at a more, I don't want to say normal level because the normal previous was two, three percent. Um, but when you get to a rate that's significantly lower than what we're seeing right now, um, and as prices stabilize, you should see some increased activity. And that's what's really accounting for our growth um, when you get out to FY25. Yeah. Any, uh, any people who delayed buying, right, waiting for that stabilization of rates to come down a little bit probably then would, would exercise that option at that time? That would be our assumption, yes, Madam Chair. Any questions, or should we entertain a motion? I guess I had a couple comments. Um, I tend to kind of agree with fiscal, especially on 23, just watching sort of what's going on. Um, permits, I think, are down about 20% for the last couple months of this year is what we're seeing. And then the other part, which is really hard to quantify, <clears throat> but over 2021 and part of 2022, we saw an enormous number of really large, expensive things change hands. I think I counted like 60 transactions over $50 million. And those are things like apartments, industrial buildings. And this was Clark County. I don't track all the counties up here as well. But so I think, but now I think nobody's gonna buy those a second time, but the inflated rate that they paid for them in 2022, 2023, you know, going into that. So I think that some of these big, you know, I think I found one that was like $200 million, and that's all of a sudden a huge <clears throat> tax generator, but I don't see that. I think there will still there's still a bunch of industrial buildings under construction here and in the south, but I don't see that kind of juicing it as much. Um, I don't know if anyone else has comments, or I'm happy to make a motion. All right, I don't want to, like, jump in there. I'm going to go ahead and go with, the physical division for 2023. Um, I don't normally do this. I want to go a little off the reservation for 2024 and go with maybe 120 million. I just don't think it's going to get quite as low as whatever the number I'm looking for isn't there. So I think I'd like to go with about 120 million for 2024. And I think I'm pretty comfortable with physical for 2025. Is that it? I'll second that. Mr. Nakamoto, would you like to repeat the motion for the staff? Um, yes, Madam Chair, for the record, Michael Nakamoto. I think it was pretty clear, but just so we have it correct, it was one. It was the fiscal division forecast of one hundred twenty-two million five hundred seventy-two thousand in FY twenty-three, then one hundred twenty million in FY twenty-four. And then for FY25, it was the fiscal division forecast of 121290000 okay. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 That motion carries. Okay, and the last major um, general fund forecast that we will go through today is the commerce tax. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Susanna Powers, Deputy Fiscal Analyst with Fiscal Analysis Division. Uh, I do not have a presentation for this. I was going to talk off of the Table 8, which is your green sheet. So in that uh, table uh, eight, um, the commerce tax forecast is displayed on the second page right below the real property transfer tax. Uh, commerce tax is pretty complicated tax because of the 
first 4 million exemption on Nevada gross revenue and the structure of the tax with 26 different industries, each with different tax rate. You may remember from the past meetings how we proceed to forecast this tax. The staff from taxation, budget office, and fiscal division get together and think through various scenarios of how the economy may influence this tax given the various industry mix. We have not had any new information uh, since our last meeting, so the consensus forecast did not change from last month. So looking at the Table 8, uh, the forecast is uh, 301,800,000 in fiscal 23, 321,558,000 in fiscal 24, and 339,548,000 in fiscal 25. Then by law, businesses can take up to 50% of their commerce tax paid during the preceding year as credit against their MBT liability if they have payroll in the state. Once we have the commerce tax estimate, we can then project the commerce tax credits based on the history we have with this tax. The commerce tax credit forecast is on the second last page of the Table 8, which is the green sheet. The estimated commerce tax credits are 50,645,000 in fiscal 23, 54,542,000 in fiscal 24, 58,098,000 in fiscal 25. Unless there are questions, Madam Chair, uh, the motion would be to approve both the commerce tax and the commerce tax credits under this agenda item. Thank you, Ms. Powers. Any discussion? Someone like to make that motion formally? I'll make a motion that we approve the commerce tax estimate as well as the Tomer commerce tax credits as been presented to us. Second. Any further discussion? Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 That motion passes. That in concludes uh, agenda item six. Agenda item number seven is the review and approval of forecasts of minor general fund revenues and tax credits for fiscal 23, 24, and 25, approved by the Technical Advisory Committee on Future State Revenues at its November 29th, 2022 meeting. For that review, we'll go uh, turn it over to Mr. Gindin. Thank you, Madam Chair. For the record, Russell Gindin with the Fiscal Analysis Division. And so the tables for this agenda item actually begin on page 73 of the printed economic form packet. And um, so table five is just basically showing you for some of the, what we call the major minors, uh, uh, in terms of the forecast that the Technical Advisory Committee approved and then the forecast from each of the forecasters. And then just for a quick review uh, that the process is, is that the uh, staff from the Governor's Finance Office and the Fiscal Analysis Division for the first round ask all the agencies responsible for administering each of the revenue sources under this agenda item for their forecast. And then that's reviewed by GFO and Fiscal and, and we produce a consensus to bring forward to the Technical Advisory Committee for their review. So as you know, that happened uh, for the last forecast cycle of the meetings. So here we don't go out and ask all the agencies again because some of them are just sort of de minimis and there's really not any information. But for some of the, the larger ones, like in, for the treasurer's interest income and unclaimed property, the secretary of state ones, we do ask those agencies if they uh, have a revised forecast to provide to us or not, and then we can reconsider that. And so then again, GFO and fiscal, they'll redo their forecast as well as we'll get revised forecasts from taxation and gaming control board for the ones you see on the sheets for administered by those two agencies. And then we bring that forward to the technical advisory committee. And so basically uh, what you see is on page 75, table six of the printed packet is the uh, Forecast that was approved by the Technical Advisory Committee on their meeting uh, at their meeting on November 29th. And uh, so that is the forecast being brought forward for your consideration as the economic forum for review. 
and, uh, uh, and approving some forecasts for the revenue sources as well as the tax credit programs. And, and so, Madam Chair, members of the forum, I'm not going to go through all these like you just did for the majors. Uh, but I just did want to make a few observations on the record uh, comparable to those made at the Technical Advisory Committee um, because there are some of them that have a few comments that should probably be made on the public record for this body. And so if you're looking at Table 6, you can see that for the first two revenue sources, the net proceeds of minerals and then the new tax that was approved during the 21 session, the mining gross revenue tax on, on businesses in uh, extracting gold and silver, that you can see there's no forecast for FY24 and FY25. That's based on the provisions approved in AB495 from the 21 session, that uh, those proceeds will, beginning in FY24, uh, will be ded dedicated to the state education fund, which is the fund that provides uh, revenue for funding K-12 education in the state of Nevada. So that, that just it looks funny that suddenly there's no forecast. So I wanted to get that out there. Uh, then uh, you can see under the, the advanced license fees uh, for under the gaming, uh, it's GL 3046 uh, for reference, that it's low and then goes up for FY24. That's the assumption is Mr. Lawton went, the Fontaine Blue will be opening in FY2024, triggering advanced license fees in that fiscal year. Then you can see GL 3073, the Transportation Connection Excise Tax. This is the 3% tax on people who charge you the move them around, such as Uber, Lyft, but it also includes taxi cabs and other motor carriers that transport passengers. Uh, and so the, the only reason why I bring it up here, uh, you can see FY24, it, it goes up and then goes down and it goes back up. This is because under the law, each biennium, the first $5 million of this tax it is required to be deposited in the state highway fund, not the state general fund. So that's why you get the up and down pattern. If you want to, for comparable uh, com uh, viewpoint across the three years, add $5 million to FY24 to just see what it looks like. Uh, so then uh, the, the next page, there's nothing there because it's all MBT. So I would go to the table on uh, the continuing the table on page 77 of the packet. And there you can see GL 3051, uh, the government, governmental services tax. Uh, there's the forecast. I only want to point out that uh, the amount there, again, under the law of the state portion of the governmental services tax, under current law, 25% is dedicated to the state general fund. 75% goes to the state highway fund. And so that's the amount you see here is the 25%. And it looks all normal here, but I just want to put that out for the record that if you would go look at our tables that have more history, it looks like it was bigger. Now, this is the revenue source that the governor and legislature will sometimes make adjustments, especially during economic downturns, to the amount that's allocated to the highway fund versus to the general fund. So if you look back historically, it can look like it's bouncing around. It's not necessarily because the GST is moving around that much. It's they're moving the percentage between the highway fund and the general fund. But So that was just the statement that I wanted to make there. Uh, then... I think it's worth mentioning under GL 3066, which is, um, excuse me, on page 78, and it's GL 3066, the short-term car lease. So this has always has traditionally been the uh, short-term uh, car lease, the 10% tax on Hertz rental, uh, dollar, the rental car companies. But uh, there's a bill passed in the 21 session to uh, require uh, the peer-to-peer -peer sharing platforms, such as Turo, people renting their cars now, are Turo is required to collect the 10% tax, which is the statewide rate. And then in Clark and Washoe, there's an additional 2% that's part of the short-term car rental that all at also then attaches to these uh, individuals who are renting their cars on Turo or comparable platforms under the peer-to-peer the -peer, uh, sharing platform under the statutory structure. So since that's the same tax amount, the same tax structure, we're just uh, in reporting that, including that amount under the peer-to-peer -peer in the short-term car rental, uh, primarily because um, given the limited number of taxpayers uh, reporting paying the tax, the Department of Taxation would have concerns with regards to actually breaking out and reporting that separately and getting into disclosure issues that, they, that they're not re allowed to report 
uh, individual taxpayer or allow you to deduce. So thus, uh, I just wanted to point out that you can see that and it looks a little stronger than it may have been if you'd go back and look at history because there's a now additional tax piece in there, the peer-to-peer. Uh, and so finally, uh, it's worth, I think, mentioning that you look at the, the next page, GL 3290, the treasurer's interest income, uh, that it uh, goes up uh, quite a bit in FY23 and then more in FY24 and, FY, and then comes back down in FY25. We shouldn't be totally surprised there because, right, interest rates are uh, being increased by the Federal Reserve. So the, even though, the, the, so thus the treasurer's portfolio, that they can go out and invest, they can earn more. Also, we know that uh, the FY 2022 actual compared to the forecast was significantly over. The, you're going to be revising the FY 23 forecast up. So you have more in the portfolio against higher interest rates. Also, uh, what's also in play here is the ARPA money, the, f the federal stimulus money, uh, that the state's still uh, spending that. Well, under the federal guidance and a state and Nevada law, any interest rate, any interest that's earned on the investment of those proceeds is allowed to be retained by the state. And then under our state law, it's required to be deposited in the state general fund. So we still have some of the ARPA money. It'll still be going out. So that's why you sort of see the pattern with the, the, the extra money that we have because the actual is coming in before above the forecast, the forecast for 23 being revised up. Uh, and then the higher interest rates in the federal money leads to the pattern that you see in the forecast of it going up through 24 and then falling back a little bit in 25. And with that, Madam Chair, those were the comments that I wanted to make about the revenues. Then with regards to the tax credits, that, that, that's information coming from we know how much that the law is governing uh, are the maximum amounts that can be issued or available. Then what we have to do is work with the agencies that are responsible for administering those programs. They provide us information as to what they think might be in the pipeline to be approved for credits, as well as what's been issued but not yet been taken. And so all that is taken into consideration when we're doing the forecast for the tax credits. And so that is uh, then reflected in the forecast that you see here. And with that, Madam Chair, uh, were the comments I wanted to make, other than I would caution people like we did at the tech, when you go look at this, it looks like 24 and 25, that those two fiscal years of the biennium compared to the 21-23 biennium. There's, hey, the growth doesn't seem that strong. Well, remember, you're losing the net proceeds in the gold and silver, which is, if you go look at those two, it's approximately about $150 million a fiscal year or $300 million over the biennium. So you just need to keep that in mind when you're going to go look at this and try and make a, a comparison of the biennium, the next biennium compared to the, the current biennium in terms of forecasts. And with that, that will conclude my comments and can answer any questions that the members may have. Thank you, Mr. Gindin. I don't see any questions from the forum members. So at this time, should we recess the meeting and allow? I'll need a motion and a second to actually approve oh. the, the forecast and the tax credits that are reflected here in table six under this agenda item, Madam Chair. I'll go ahead and make a motion to approve the tax credits and um, forecast for the TAC. Um, minor general fund. Minor for the minor general fund revenue. Second. I'll second that. Any discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 The motion carries. Okay, so now, Madam Chair, yeah, that I think the, the economic forum, if you'd like to put the form in recess, and then uh, fiscal staff will go back and do what we do, which is get all the numbers of tables, check the numbers, and then get them into the form forecast report, and then uh, we'll come back here. I mean, I, I always know that we say, like, I think it went from a half an hour to 45 minutes. It'll probably be close to an hour by the time we can get everything in, get the report, check everything, and then get copies made. So I think that a lot, this will be appropriate then to allow you to go enjoy your lunch, and then uh, when we come back, we'll uh, can, can reconvene, Madam Chair. Great, thank you. So we will call the December 5th, 2022 meeting of the Economic Forum in recess. <laughs>